Good morning, everyone. Kia ora and welcome to Economic and Growth Committee this morning. I have um, got a cold. I just thought I'd just declare that right at the beginning of the meeting. Not COVID. Um, but we are first off going to open the meeting this morning with Councillor Fitzgerald, who will open with a karaoke. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Tātou um, I'd just like to explain that the meeting has been recorded and we're being live streamed on the YouTube channel and uh, welcome to Councillor Naylor who's online. Um, the health and safety, we've got a few visitors here today so just if we have an emergency we will follow um, our lovely administrators out but we've got to go through the exits and we will follow them out um, through the exits and um, just remember um, councillors that are online, Councillor Naylor, that you need to um, just make sure that you are um, showing yourself when you are on screen on your camera and um, please um, text through any amendments if you need to through to the administrator. Um, right, first off apologies. We don't have any apologies so we'll move to the next one. Notif notification of additional items. We don't have any additional items and declarations of interest. Is there any declarations of interest of any items today? No? <coughs> we'll move to the next one, which is public comment. Do we have any public comment today? No. Right. That's great. We're now moving to item number five, which is the minutes, which I can't actually move, but um, Councillor Wood will move and seconded by Councillor Bowen. Is there any um, items that anyone would like to bring up from the minutes of the last meeting? No, we'll go to go to a vote on the minutes, please. <coughs> that has passed with uh, fifteen votes for and one abstention. Thank you. Now moving to item number six, and I'd like to ask um, the airport to come forward, which is. Is it? Jonathan. Sorry, Jonathan and Murray. Murray. I haven't got my run sheet. It's right here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Is Cameron not joining them? Cameron. Sorry, Cameron, are you joining them too? <laughs> we'll just wait till you to join them. So this is on page 13 of your um, paper. Good morning, Madam Chair and Councillors. Um, so this morning we have with me Jonathan Baker, the CFO from the airport company, and Murray Georgiou, who is the chairman. Uh, I'll let them talk to the six months performance to date, uh, but I do just note that, uh, that we uh, seem to be having more passenger numbers through the airport than what we had predicted for this uh, SOI, which is promising signs post-COVID um, and, and those uh, drop in passenger numbers. So, you know, I'll, I'll let the airport company talk to, talk to the results today. Is that me, Madam Chair? Do I, uh, thank you, thank you. It's you. So the first thing I'd like to do, uh, Madam Chair, is to uh, say, well, good morning to everyone, um, but introduce Jonathan Baker. So Jonathan is acting CEO uh, for the next three weeks uh, in place of David Lanham, who is on, on annual leave. Jonathan's been with us for about uh, two and a half years as our Chief Financial Officer. You'll note that on the, um, the first part of the presentation it says about me. That's actually about Jonathan, that's not, uh, not me. Okay? So he, he'll just tell you a wee bit about his background. Um, so I understand that the first 
uh, section of this is about the interim result that is up to the 30th of June 2000, uh, sorry, the 31st of December uh, 2022, so we'll, we'll compartmentalise that. Um, for that six months, um, the great thing, I suppose, about Palmerston North Airport, it was open for business for that whole time and we had an increasing number of passengers, as Cam has just uh, uh, announced, uh, which has been good for, uh, good for the company, clearly, but also very good for the economy, uh, that we've got more traffic through the, uh, through the uh, airport. Those higher passenger numbers result in higher revenues, um, some higher costs, clearly, uh, but that's reflected in our six monthly result. You'll see that the financial performance is very strong. We did make sure that we noted there were some non-recurring items in there of significance such that uh, they, they, they won't be repeated. We can't rely on those. They were timing uh, issues and a one-off issue, so they made quite a significant contribution positive to the financial performance. Uh, other highlights, though, th during that six months was the first uplift of our LGFA tranche, and if I haven't, I should have already thanked the uh, Council for supporting us uh, with that line of credit. Um, it's, uh, it, it provides us with uh, much more certainty um, uh, for the future, uh, as was presented when we did our SOI last year, the need for that and so on. Uh, there was one negative finding or one negative aspect, I suppose, of that six months. It's not reflected in our financial results, and it will get discussed in the SOI, and I'll, I'll leave it to then, but it was really a, around our, um, our uh, assessment of the seismic rating of our facilities, particularly the terminal, and how we then ventured into detailed seismic assessment, which gave us a much more... Um, well, a negative result to what we had anticipated. And that has flavoured the SOI when we look forward. But we'll talk about that in the second part of the, of the uh, sorry, in the next item, which is, is at item seven. Um, so at this stage, I'll just pass over to Jonathan, who will take us through the first six months' uh, results. And thereafter, Madam Chair, I presume it'll be open for questions. Is that right? Thank you, Murray. And Tenakoto Katoa. I thought I'd, conscious that it's usually David sitting here and not me, and this is my first time talking to you today, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background about... Jonathan, do you want to pull the microphone closer to your... Thank you. A little bit of background about who I am. Um, I'm afraid to admit I'm not a Palmy boy originally. I hail from Auckland, um, so forgive me, but I started my um, career up there with the accounting firm Ernst & Young. I was there for about five years in their tax practice uh, before making the move to New Zealand, like much of the team out at the airport. I was in New Zealand in a variety of finance roles for just under four years, uh, escaping there prior to COVID's arrival and moving to MetLife Care Retirement Villages. Um, I was there for about a year or so before the opportunity came up to move to the Mighty Manawatu and have been with Paimi Airport in this role for, as Murray says, about two and a half years now. Um, so while I can't claim to be Paimi born, my uh, five-month-old son certainly can claim that privilege. Moving on to the real topic though for today and our interim report. Uh, and the highlights. Um, we managed to keep the fundamentals ticking over, uh, retaining our zero lost time injury performance and maintaining part 139 compliance throughout the six month period. We also had a very positive NPS or net promoter score for the first six months of 45, so that's compared to our um, SOI target of 30. We've changed the way that we collect NPS data during that six months. That's meant that um, for the first half of calendar 22, we only collected about 200 surveys. Uh, for the second half, we collected two and a half thousand. Um, so we're getting far richer insights from customers now about what's mattering to them and getting a lot more confidence in that score. We also had another team engagement uh, survey, uh, this time around scoring 81%. That's up from 71% 12 months ago um, and reflects the, the great wellness program and buy-in of our team. Uh, we also achieved the Coolmark Gold Sustainability Tourism Award in November 22, so that's an annual... Um, award that, uh, that we would have to reapply for, uh, but really that speaks to best practice across a whole range of areas from financials to people to sustainability and health and safety. We're the only regional airport in the country to have that award. Um, we also re-accredited our level two of the airport carbon accreditation program, uh, but I'll talk more about that in the SOI presentation. 
So on to the first half in the financials. It's fair to say that passenger numbers um, and the recovery since Omicron and Delta has been far better than what we budgeted. 276,000 passengers for the first six months is 19% above budget and 90,000 more than the same time last year when Auckland was coming out of lockdown. Um, those higher passenger numbers have translated to higher revenue, 21% uh, above budget at six, just over six million. And while revenue has been very strong, costs uh, have been um, had strong cost controls uh, in place, which has meant they're only 3% unfavourable to budget. Uh, that's largely due to some uh, large and unexpected legal costs. So normalised profit came in at just over a million dollars for the first half of the year, compared to a budget of 200 grand. Um, Murray has talked about a couple of timing differences that are in there as why we're talking about normalised profit, just to make that uh, money, those comparatives a bit more meaningful. CapEx-wise, we only spent $600,000 of a budget of 3.9 for the year. Um, that's due to the delay in this terminal redevelopment getting underway, um, but also um, because of the wet summer causing some of our works to get delayed into the second half. Speaking of the second half, there's a few um, projects underway that are going to get traction in the next few months. Uh, the most exciting one is $700,000 worth of new shelters being installed along the red pickup drop-off line outside the terminal. Um, so that'll provide a lot more um, better wet weather cover for customers waiting for pickup or drop off. We've also undertaken a review of our wayfinding signage um, and identified some issues that can make it confusing for customers knowing where to go when they're arriving at the airport. Um, so we're upgrading the signage in the car park and on the approaches to make that clearer. We're also progressing with uh, the design of 6,000 square metres of warehouses on the northern side of Airport Drive, just opposite McGregor Street with a view to getting underway with construction in the new financial year. And just last month, we spent another $390,000 on an upgrade of Airport Drive between Massey and McGregor. We're also planning before winter to spend 1.1 mil on airport pavement upgrades. That's largely on some roads that end of life here side. We're also pushing very hard with achieving level four transformation of the airport carbon accreditation program. So for the full year, uh, we're currently forecasting at least 534,000 passengers, which is 16% up on budget. Forecast profit is looking to be over 200% favourable to budget, um, although, again, it's worth noting some of that is a timing difference with the land sale occurring this year that was budgeted last year and some costs um, being deferred into a subsequent in income year. Um, but really, that all looks very positive um, for FY23 with profit of over 200% favourable. Um, but if you'll pardon the puns, this year really is about getting us into the best possible um, holding pattern uh, to be able to deal with the headwinds that we've got coming up in the SOI period. That is me. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're happy to take questions? Um, the first question is from Councillor Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jonathan and Murray, for coming in and talking to us today. It's nice to see you in the uh, hot seat, Jonathan. Um, could I start by asking a question about page 23, which I believe is page 9 in your Statement of Financial Position. I want to get an understanding of your long-term borrowings. So it says for the period 31 December 22, that your long-term borrowings were at 7.7 .7 million, and that by 30th of June 23, so two months' time or three months' time, they are to be at 23.1 million, a $15.46 million increase. Is that an out-of-date statement of intent, or is that what's happening? Are you already in the process of borrowing that 15 million, I imagine, through the LGFA facility? Uh, so the June 22 column um, is obviously for December 22. There's 7.7 .7 in the long-term borrowings. There's another 5.7 in the short term, if you look further up the page. Yep. So you add those two together to give you 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, the June 23 column for 23 million is, is, is 18 months from now. Um, so that is the, 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 the bubble, sorry, it's six months from now, that's the SOI for June 23. That's where we expected to be had we been engaging on the terminal redevelopment, you know, as we thought a year ago. Um, so no, we won't be at that, um, that level in six months' time. Thank you for that. Um, if we go to page 21, which is page 7 for you, I just want to make sure my understanding is correct around at what point a dividend payment would come in. Dividends are paid, to my understanding, on your net surplus after taxation, which comes after you've covered your finance costs and debt repayment. Is that correct? Yes, it would be on the very bottom line of net surplus after tax, excluding any revaluation gain on investment property. 
Okay, so what I'm trying to understand is, because I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about it more in the statement of intent, but my understanding is, as is indicated on page 19, that cash preservation is important. If a prospective dividend would be paid out of what you have left over after you've paid your debt costs, what is the risk to being able to service your debt of paying a dividend? You mean if we were to pay a dividend in the current financial year? For the future financial years. Uh, really, the, the payment of a dividend in a position where we need to go from a capital-based a capital base perspective, the, big, the, the inefficiency that comes with that is we essentially end up borrowing to pay, debt, uh, to pay a dividend. So we end up incurring higher levels of debt, um, therefore higher levels of interest in order to return a dividend sooner than when we're at a position where CapEx is stabilised. It is very much part of the uh, SOI conversation to come. OK, so the intention is for net profit after tax to be used to service debt, well, p at least in part to service debt. Absolutely, yes. All right. And my final question was related to page 27 on a different line of thinking. Um, under employee expenses, you've got salary and wages, wages increasing from 840,000 to 1.68 million, which is almost a doubling of employee salaries and wages. I was just wondering, is that increases in staff pay in line with inflation? Is that hiring new staff? What What's the makeup of that near double? Yes, the first column there to June, to, sorry, to December 22 at 840 is um, six months worth of the year. The June 23 column to across at 1.7 million is 12 months worth. Apologies, so no, I understand. Double. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, gentlemen. Just on the warehousing, could you just could you just repeat what you're doing in that in that freight and that uh, and and um, and probably the physical side that you're doing there? Sure. We again we've got slides on this uh, in the next. Oh, have next you? Section. Okay. Well, maybe I will just leave it till then. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a question from me. Um, you're on page 21. You talk about marketing. I just want you to unbundle what you're actually spending on marketing. Uh, so the $40,000 spent year to date on marketing covers a variety of things, including community engagement. So that includes our sponsorships of um, things like Just Silch, Wild Base, Centre Point, etc. Um, it also includes the Fly Palmy, Fly, Fly, Fly Palmy branding um, that we have. It just noticed there that it's well done on um, prior 12 months or prior full year forecast. We are we have been very conservative in that space in the in the last period. And you've got commitments in that area that you've got on. You have to. We we certainly have um, yes sponsorship agreements in place with um, various community groups. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Jonathan. Nice to see you, Murray. Um, firstly, congratulations on the results. They, they read really well. Just a couple of things I've noticed in your slides, Jonathan. The airport drive upgrade of $390,000. Can you just tell us where that was? Oh, did you say McGregor Street? Um, so it's Airport Drive, and it's on the area between um, McGregor Street and Massey, and it's on the west westbound slow lane. Um, so if you drive down that area at the moment, you'll see it looks very shiny and black. Um, that's the area that's been dug out in the last <laughs> month. Fantastic. So the upgrades you're talking about weren't actual council property upgrades? No, Airport Drive is an asset almost entirely owned by the airport. Thanks. And just lastly, your, your um, last comment in your slides, um, a routine, um, a, a positive result, but strong headwinds ahead. Can you give us... Um, bit of a picture about what those headwinds are unless they're to come and fit. That is slides. very much the topic of conversation, yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's all the um, questions that we've got today So on this report. So um, we'll look to move. Um, if you can step back. I know you're just going to probably move your chairs back because we'll need you in a minute. Um, I'll look to move this recommendation, seconded by Councillor Wood. Um, that the committee received the interim report and financial statements of the Palms North Airport Limited for the period ended the 31st of December 
2022, presented to the committee on the 12th of April 2023. Um, going into comment, and the first comment is from the Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You didn't give me enough time to write down my notes, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I'll wing this, as I normally do. Excuse the pun. Um, so... <laughs> just want to acknowledge uh, the airport company. Thank you for your work. Um, as Councillor Fitzgerald said, it has been a pleasing... Those that have been sitting around the table a bit longer will, will remember some pretty challenging numbers and some pretty challenging um, SOIs that were in front of us um, for aviation in general, really, just not Palmerston North Airport. But uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing a improvement, definite improvement. Um, I suppose from... From our perspective, again, um, congratulations on a good um, uh, period, um, but as you've signalled, um, there's some strong wins to come. We need to diversify our income, um, and I think uh, signalling that uh, the freight and the warehousing and the Te Tanganui Central New Zealand Distribution Hub, which is right in the, on the doorstep of the airport, is a massive opportunity for um, not only the city, uh, the airport company, but the wider region, in fact, New Zealand. So the, the freight aspect of what the airport does can't be underestimated because it actually um, underpins and, and actually diversifies a lot of uh, other um, opportunities and, and activity for them. Flight training as well, um, and it was great to see... Um, uh, Ash Hocken yesterday uh, having a chat to the Deputy Mayor and myself and uh, um, they have some challenges as well but I think that they can be overcome. It's more of a setting perspective on capping of numbers etc for flight uh, pilots etc. So look I just want to congratulate the airport. I just want to just touch a little bit on history too, why we've got somebody in the room. The airport's 92 years old. So flying began at, in Milson in 1931, something that unfortunately the airport or the city didn't really two years ago celebrate. Um, and it's one of New Zealand's homes, homes of aviation. 1936, national home to Union Airways. Then NAC for a brief time, which became Air New Zealand, of course. Um, so you could almost say to Air New Zealand, we were the home of Air New Zealand. Not that they'd probably admit that. Um, but look, there's been some great aviators. Sir George Bolt, you'll know that name from a drive that you leave Auckland Airport on, but he actually was here in Palmerston North with Union Airways. Um, McGregor, Mackenzie, McLeod, all the Scots were here, but they were great avi early aviators. And Len Man Mangum. So Len was the, 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 the boss of the whole lot. And just want to acknowledge um, um, a relative of his in the, in the gallery, Lindsay Elston. And Lindsay's... Um, wanting to get, not, not, not let the airport forget its heritage. And I hope that if there is a terminal upgrade or some sort of terminal um, uh, refurbishment, that the heritage is not lost, um, because certainly other airports um, do this. Um, Auckland and Christchurch are two examples. But anyway, thank you. I rattled on. Sorry, but I needed to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Just want to acknowledge the airport for the work that they've done to um, December 31, 2022. Well done on a good report, and thank you for all the hard work that you have done. We'll look to vote. having problems with my card. <laughs> That's passed six, unanimously with 16 votes. Thanks, everybody. We'll now move to item number seven on page 31. So if we can have back up um, Cameron, Murray and Jonathan, thank you. So starting with you, Cameron. This is the, just to say, this is the draft statement of intent for the airport. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think for this, I'll largely take the paper as read and let the airport uh, run through so, uh, with the statement of intent proposal that, they, that they've come up with um, and some of the challenges that they face. Uh, I guess in the last paper they briefly touched upon some of the, of the headwinds and, and I think particularly through this period from, from our perspective, uh, manage, uh, managing of cash flow is going to be something that's, that's important to them, um, particularly as they go p potentially through a, a capital development phase um, uh, and, and to manage their overall effects on, on their total debt. But I'll let them uh, outline the SOI and some of the headwinds that they, that they face. Thanks, Murray. Thanks, Madam Chair. So the first thing I'd talk about uh, when we look at the future is what is uh, the Palmerston North Airport Limited approach. And um, I think it's best described as targeting a number of things. One firstly and, and foremostly is that it's a compliant aeronautical facility. Uh, our priority is on our, um, our aeronautical assets. That's first and foremost. If we don't uh, secure those into the future. We haven't got, uh, you know, a um, an opportunity for planes in and out of in and out of our town and our community. Um, sorry, in and out of our city, our community. Uh, so that's regulatory. Um, it's it's all about where we've invested in the past and where we have to maintain our investment in the future. That's first and foremost. Secondly, we're very much after all customers enjoying their experience. And that isn't um, just the passengers, that's their friends and families, that's our freight companies, that's the companies that operate in and around the airport. Uh, it's everyone who uh, utilises those assets. Our landside assets, uh, uh, I think I've described this in the past, they are underutilised and we would like to uh, further develop those as and when the opportunities arise. And that's really about... Um, improving the efficiency of those, but income diversification as well. So that becomes our third, uh, our third uh, uh, target area, I suppose. And overall, our returns to the shareholder, um, Palmerston North City Council, can't be measured by dollars alone. It comes in many shapes, many forms, and it's about having a gateway. It's about having an experience. It's about the financial performance. It's about our social support. And it's even about some of our environmental benefits. So the airport is not a one shop or a one um, uh, modal or, or um, uh, one, one way of, of, of judging its performance. It's across so many things. Um, so that's, that's our approach for the future, has been for the past and will be for the future. When we look at our SOI, uh, there are several features in there. Clearly, the biggest one, and we've talked about it, is around our terminal. Um, that comes as our second priority because we are making sure that our, our runway and taxiways and so on are, um, are compliant and are well invested. The next stage is then our terminal. And the story behind it, it's this fairly short backstory, but I'll tell you anyway, um, it's that we were looking for a refurbishment. We included that in our SOI last year, and we said that we would be spending up to about $26 million refurbishing our, our terminal. And then pursuing that, uh, we had to look at what were the options um, in terms of refurbishment versus a new build. We needed to look at such things as our seismic rating. We had uh, various assessments which we had to turn those into detailed seismic assessments to help with the new build and whatever else. We were building um, our, our um, dollars and our assumptions on previous workings that we had. What we discovered when we did our detailed seismic assessment was that um, the rating was significantly lower than what we had and that to refurbish just to accommodate those needs was $37 million. At the same time and running parallel with that we were looking at a new build and what that would look like and the design features came in at around $65 million. Um, the board in its uh, uh, 
in, uh, in its deliberations looked at 65 million, said that is unaffordable. We can't have what we would like to have as our as our gateway. This is not a monument that we can um, uh, that we can afford. We have brought that back to a very very cut down version, uh, which is 40 million dollars, which coincidentally happens to be not far away from the refurbishment cost. So that's where we've gone with that. If you look at our SOI from last year, we said that we would tap out at about $55 million debt. Uh, we are still maintaining that level of future indebtedness. Uh, in fact, it's $54 million we're suggesting at this stage. So we've tried to live within the funding available, um, our, our own self-imposed uh, level of funding. Uh, so that, that is a, uh, a major feature of our SOI, and I'm sure um, the council and, the sh you know, as the shareholders, will want to have quite a significant discussion on that. The one thing I do remind everyone, though, is that the airport has not sought uh, any capital in the past 15-odd uh, years. Uh, this is through COVID uh, at, and other um, investments that it's had, and it's not intending to look to council for capital injection uh, into the future. This is debt that the company can borrow and repay uh, over time. It does have impacts, of course, on what else we could invest in. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, we will continue in our planning to have various community support. That does include the road, um, although I'm sure there is some discussion necessary around that as well, so that large uh, piece of airport drive from JFK uh, through to the McGregor uh, intersection and then from the airport roundabout down to railway road roundabout, those two sections of road are still owned by uh, the airport, uh, even though on our reckoning 70% of the use of that is for other purposes. In other words, 30% of the people using airport drive access airport facilities, 70% do not. So that has impeded our, um, our ability to um, develop some of the facilities because to do so, we need to bring the road, I think rebuild the road actually to a, I don't know what your um, term is, it a 50 year um, 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 specification or something like that. It, it's, it's worth about nine to $10 million, which is all the benefit that we would otherwise uh, gain by developing those assets. So, uh, so that's a, a, a hurdle for us. If we look at the rest of our SOI, we've built this around very much around uh, where our passenger numbers have got to. They're, they're ahead of where we thought they would be. Uh, Air New Zealand provides us with a, a view of their uh, of their uh, schedules. Uh, and with that, that's where we build our passenger numbers based pretty much on those. Uh, there, was, there was a plan, I think, for 2024 initially that we would have jets returning to the city because of the number of uh, passengers uh, in first thing in the morning and that to replace a two to three planes with a jet would be much more efficient from, uh, from passengers and from uh, Air New Zealand's perspective. Uh, that might... Uh, or that it's not might, it won't happen then because we haven't got those numbers yet, but we are planning for those. And of course, uh, <clears throat> if we do have those, we have to have a facility that can accommodate it. Our terminal at this stage doesn't. Uh, the rest of our, of our uh, SOI is pretty much hinged around um, in, uh, maintaining our asset base, improving the customer experience, and wherever possible, uh, developing our, our, um, our uh, assets uh, for in income diversification. You will also find, as requested from the statement of expectations, that there is the return of a dividend at the end of the SOI period. Um, there is a presentation here now with the detail of it, which might be quite helpful from Jonathan. Not sure there's really any point anymore after <laughs> Uh, that, um, but anyway, nevertheless, some of what Shay will say is a, is a repeat of what Murray has just talked to, and I think it's worth repeating because there are some very good nuggets in there, Murray. Thank you very much. 
Um, onto the SOI now, and starting with what really is that key headwind which I finished on earlier, um, it is the terminal redevelopment. Uh, it overshadows everything else in this SOI. It's going to significantly impact us for the next couple of years. Um, there is no getting away from that fact. At an estimated price tag of $40 million, it is the single largest investment the airport has ever made and is, is the most critical one for the future. In past SOIs, when we've spoken about the cost of this project, it's been in the price range of sort of 15 to $26 million. It was $26 million in last year's SOI. That was predicated, as Murray said, on the assumption that we'd be refurbishing what we've got. But we now know that is, it is not an option to refurb. We must go for a rebuild. Um, the reasons we have to do this are the ones that are up on screen. Um, our current seismic rating is below where it needs to be long term. So in order for us to protect the asset and the ability for the airport to function, we have to upgrade. And really it is the seismic element that is pushing us towards a, a, a rebuild option rather than the refresh. But equally important to that is the ability to conduct and hold, pa uh, hold bag screening um, when that becomes mandated by the government or in response to a national threat. At the moment, the terminal does not have the capacity to screen and hold large numbers of passengers ready to board an aircraft and doesn't have the facilities available to screen their baggage either. Um, it's only a matter of time for when that is going to become mandated, um, so we do have to prepare and grow. Linked with, linked with that is the intention to return to jet operations, particularly on the Palmy Auckland route in the coming years. Uh, regardless of what happens with screening on the turboprop aircraft we have at the terminal today, uh, jets require screening, so we need to be able to prepare for that. And then there is just the natural passenger future growth and route development. Prior to COVID, we were getting close to 700,000 passengers per annum. And at that point, the terminal was groaning, particularly at key, um, at busy times. It was very uncomfortable at some parts of the terminal. We know we're going to get back to that sort of level of passengers within the next three years. Um, so we need to grow, uh, grow to be able to handle that, uh, just not only the next three years, but up to the next 20 plus years of growth. Um, if we don't do that, we become severely constrained and the number of passengers and therefore revenue will become constrained as well. But even if none of those were issues, and the only thing we had to do was seismic, um, and the only thing we had to do was strengthen the existing terminal, the quantity surveyor has calculated that just to give us back exactly what we have today will cost $36 million and take three years. So we'll be a construction site for three years, have $36 million of cost on the balance sheet, and we won't achieve any of the objectives that we require other than being seismically resilient. But there's no hiding from the fact that at 40 mil, um, this does constrain us from achieving some of the other expectations in the SOE within the short term. Um, debt peaks at 40, $54 million in three years' time compared to our current debt of only about $11 million, and our financial metrics also are constrained. They're compliant, but they're constrained. Stepping away from the terminal for a minute, there's still some other uh, areas of capex that we do need to spend money on in the next three years. That includes $2.9 million on critical airside works um, and a further $1.3 million on the car park, so that includes an extension to increase capacity and starting to introduce license plate recognition. We've also got another $1 million earmarked for more upgrades along Airport Drive. Um, to the earlier question around the uh, warehouses, we talked about how the um, terminal cost at 40 mil does constrain our ability to spend uh, in the short term on income diversification projects. That big extra 40 million, 14 million that we had in last year's SOI earmarked towards diversification projects it has to go towards the terminal. We do have enough money in the budget though for half of the price of 6,000 square metres of warehouses in what we call Zone D. So that's on the northern side of Airport Drive just opposite McGregor Street. It's those areas in red. And the bottom picture is an example of what those warehouses are intended to look like. These warehouses fit very well within the existing airport master plan, which earmarks this area for freight and logistics. But in order to um, complete that development and to, to look at accelerating other income diversification opportunities within the SOI period, we are going to need to look at strategic partnerships in order to progress. That's something that we're very much front of mind for us at the moment and something that we're very much working on um, securing that funding. We've also renamed Ruapehu Business Park during the period now to Ruapehu Aero Park. 
uh, which makes it a bit clearer that the locate when we're selling the park that you know, the location of it is within the airport campus and also um, the, the freight and logistics elements of it towards to you Tanganui. Underpinning everything else is the um, ongoing focus on health and safety. Just a couple areas to point out here in the three year SOI. One is our part 139 recertification audit that will be coming up with the CAA. Um, the second one is our ongoing ground and air noise uh, monitoring program that's ongoing, um, which is really about protecting our social license with the community. On the social license and community engagement, I thought it would be worth just pointing out today uh, all the different uh, community groups that we have been involved with over the past 12 months. Uh, so you can see those up on screen with the likes of Centrepoint, Just Silch, Wild Base, Lions Mini Golf Course, uh, New Coal, and uh, the Fly Palmy Arena all featuring community engagement and paying that social dividend remains very important to us in the SOI um, and is a key element. Also a key focus is our sustainability journey, and it is a journey. Uh, I thought we'd give you a brief update about where we've got to recently. So earlier this year, we had our level two uh, recertification renewed with the Airport Carbon Accreditation Program, which certified that we had a further 8.2% reduction in our scope one and two emissions over the three year average in FY22. That brought our total emissions down for the 22 to 191 tonnes for the year, which makes our own uh, direct carbon emissions equivalent to about 11 average New Zealanders. We're now focused on achieving level four or transformation of the program, which has a much wider focus um, and makes us look at and consider mapping our scope three emissions as well, and also working with a tenant of ours to uh, actively encourage them or actively support them to reduce their own emissions, which then in turn reduce our scope three emissions. We're also looking at the future of solar and hydrogen and how that within the airport campus and the future that that is, is sure to play in, in the coming years. Also interestingly on screen you can see there with the FY23 forecast of scope one and twos, uh, we're estimating to make a 64% reduction on FY22 this year, which is gonna bring our total emissions down to only about 71 tonnes or four people. This year we've made two major changes that are contributing to that. The first is the removal of our natural gas boiler uh, and the second is investing in renewable energy through renewable energy certificates, which has completely removed any emissions from electricity. So besides the social dividend and continuing to invest uh, in sustainability, we are also committed to reintroducing cash dividends when the financials allow it. So to that end, we've included in the SOI in year three uh, a dividend with a note that that's subject to annual review. We've also proposed introducing a revised dividend policy with five metrics against which any future dividend will be assessed. This is to make it much more transparent about how the dividend is being set and also recognises that current financial performance is a very poor measure of a level of dividend when you're talking with a infrastructure company uh, who have very high capital um, requirements. The new policy instead, instead seeks to balance um, the future requirements with current cash um, performance and also looks at constraints from a debt covenant perspective. It's also in alignment with many of our peer reports. On to the numbers. Passenger volumes are forecast to be back to 581,000 in FY24 before climbing back to close to pre-COVID levels in FY26 of 654,000. That's coming off the back of a 20 year low in FY22 of only 323,000. From a profitability point of view, uh, revenue is forecast to grow 8% in FY24, um, largely on the back of that passenger growth. Expenses are also forecast to grow largely in line, um, same rate as income, uh, with inflationary pressures a lot across many of the fixed costs and maintenance lines. But interest expense is an important one to note here, with a 450% increase in interest costs over the SOI period, brought about by higher interest rates and that higher level of debt. For profit wise for FY24, we're budgeting about 1.8 million. Uh, that's down on the current year forecast as we won't have the one off land sale that occurred this year and is also being starting to be impacted by those uh, higher interest costs. Profitability uh, remains at that sort of level up to 2.5 million in the third year of the SOI. So profit does remain. In terms of capital spend and debt, the SOI has 52 million in it spread across the three years. 
that's 40 for the terminal, six on the warehouses, and the remainder largely on critical airside and landside works. Debt jumps up from about 14 mil at the end of this year to 54 million by FY26. That's, as Murray mentioned, that's lower than what we had in the uh, SOI this time last year. That had debt at 55 million. It also had revenue at about 15 mil compared to the 17 mil we're presenting to you today. Just highlighting the financial KPIs um, that I mentioned earlier relating to that debt policy, the dividend policy, sorry. The SOI has us complying with our interest cover me uh, measure for the, f for the full three years. That top number there is our only debt covenant. Uh, we get down to 2.9 in year two, so it's still above the minimum of 2.5, and then starts to grow from there. And if this graph showed you years four onwards, um, it would show you continuing to recover. The other two metrics up there are long-term targets. They're, they're never envisaged uh, to be compliant in any particular year because they are heavily influenced by things like capital investment. Those ones also show um, dipping below those long-term targets in the first couple of years before um, trending back towards compliance or achievement in year three and then improving in the years later on after that. Uh, we're very aware that when you look at this SOI just in isolation, it can seem quite daunting in terms of some of those uh, financials. Um, this is only a three-year period in a, in a company with a 50-year-plus horizon making decisions for 50-plus years of the future. Um, so just three-year view can, be look, can look quite ugly. So we thought it would be worth illustrating today one scenario where uh, we show you a 10-year horizon. So assuming that once we're through the terminal redevelopment at 40 mil, if our focus then shifted away from continued revenue diversification and instead we focused on paying down debt and paying dividends, uh, this shows you that by year, year 10 of the year 10, our income jumps all the way up to about 27 million. Um, it's, but it's worth pointing out there that, that the orange number, the non-aeronautical number, only remains at about 15% for that full period of time meaning that if there were a, another major shock to income, there is a risk with some of that income. Debt and CapEx, though, you can see that once the terminal is behind us, debt being the green line, debt stabilises until around about year six. You know, we are getting towards, the, we are going to be at where we, at a maximum debt level. That then starts to fall down by year, th uh, year 10, year FY34, to around about $30 million. Annual dividends, the blue line, also creep up over time. The assumption behind that is we go back to paying 40% dividend like we did in the past. But really that debt reduction um, is relatively modest over time and doesn't start until year six, FY30, uh, which does mean that if dividends return at, at levels we've seen in the past um, and at an earlier time, uh, we end up having a relatively modest debt reduction over that 10 years we end up being quite tapped out still in terms of how much funds we have available for income diversification in the short term. It shows that once we are through the terminal, the airport continues to wash its face with very re healthy revenue growth and debt serviceability remains without an issue. Our key metrics also remain compliant. The only question, or the, the point there being that on the dividend front, patience is required for a short while yet um, if income diversification is still considered an important outcome. That is me, thank you very much. Thank you. We've got quite a list of people wanting to ask questions. Um, I'm just gonna start off with a couple from me and then I'll go to the list. Um, my first question um, to you, Jonathan, you mentioned that jets were going to look to come into the city from Auckland. When do you see the jets coming in? The current assumption is that they will start very soon after the completion of the TDP, the terminal redevelopment. So that schedule in this SOI is scheduled to be completed by June 2026. Jets starting very shortly after. Jets is a is no by no means a guarantee and requires a Manawatu Inc approach to get them here. Um, it's something that we're very much engaged with. Uh, the likes of CETA, the Te Tanganui Steering Group, is it, a, co a, a collective effort to get jets here. So it's it's contingent on the terminal. Uh, very much, you can't have okay. jets without screening. Thank you. Second question is around your, um, you talked about income diversification, and you said that we couldn't spend the 14 million on it unless we had strategic partners. Can you just expand on what you were talking about with strategic partners and where you're going with that? 
So we have um, the warehouses are uh, 5,000, 6,000 square metres in the SOI, we've got 50% of the funding available for that. The remainder of that, which is about 6 mil, needs to come from partners. Um, the, those could be any business or organisation that is willing to partner with us to tip in cash, we tip in land um, and work together to um, develop land far quicker than what we could do alone. Um, it could also take different types of forms. It could be um, a, a, a share injection to the company, for example, maybe diluting um, the PNCC share and allowing you know, a, a return to PNCC that way. There's a whole host of opportunities on the table. So you're not wanting to drop the 14 million commitment that has to happen as part of that partnership deal? There's only the 12 million of the warehouses that are in the SOI, um, of which we're funding six. Okay. Thank you. We'll now go to the long list. We'll start off with the. We're starting with Councillor Bowen, then it goes Councillor Wood, the Mayor, then Councillor Hancock. Let's see how we go. And then you've got a few after that as well. Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will. I'll kick off with a couple and give it over to other people. Um, just to follow up on the jets question, can you explain for me why can't we have jets in our terminal? Jet passengers, the limit for screening on jet bomb aircraft is, is slightly higher than what we have today on the ATR, which has got 68 seats on it. A jet at 170 seats, it's a, a AVSEC requirement that the passengers must be screened. So in order to have a jet, you have to screen the passengers. You need to have somewhere to screen their baggage. We don't have anywhere in the terminal today where you could hold 170 people securely, separated from everybody else, and secure and screen their bags. So we don't, I know we don't have anywhere now where we could do that, but there's nothing in the footprint that would enable us to do that at the moment? We have a contingency set up at the moment within the terminal that would allow us, if there was a national threat, to very quickly overnight introduce a sterile lounge. It is a very small lounge, standing room only, and would only really work if every aircraft was going through it. It wouldn't be feasible to have um, just jet passengers going through that and ATR passengers, for example, going down a different route. It's just it would be too tight. If you're, at a, if you're at a point where you've got jet passengers, your total passenger volume, your busy hour, which is what um, terminal sizes are based on, would be so busy you'd be, it would be wall-to-wall -wall people around the departure gates. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, Murray, you made a comment about our goal being a compliant aeronautical facility. Um, what are we complying with? So was a, Jonathan had a slide about all of the things that we do. So mostly it's about uh, having um, a runway which is um, open for business. Uh, it has to be free of any debris or anything like that. It's got to have, um, it's got to have a, a substructure and it's, it's um, assessed by third parties as to whether it meets the uh, obligations of part 139 or whatever it is, 139? I'll take your word for that. <laughs> um, so as Air New Zealand is one of our big customers, uh, do they have requirements that we have to be compliant with? They have um, both requirements and preferences. Okay. And we did touch on before about the detailed seismic assessment providing us with new information that we weren't aware of. We've been obliged uh, as a good um, partner to provide that information to Air New Zealand, who are contemplating what that means for them. At this point, they uh, we we believe that um, they have they have asked us to consider how this could be um, adjusted, what time frame that will be, and what sort of risk mitigations uh, have we got in place to minimise um, um, the any any potential impact. So uh, that meeting was with them two weeks ago, uh, and will be a, a, a piece of uh, work in progress for the for the uh, next few weeks and months. So, what is the risk to the future operation of the airport if Air New Zealand don't like our seismic rating? If they don't like it and we don't respond to it, then they have a choice if they so so took it to say they would um, seek not to land here. Um, we, we don't think that's 
you know, I don't mean to be scaring the horses, that would be silly. We don't want that to happen, and we would be doing all we can to make sure it doesn't. And how does our seismic rating compare to other airport facilities in New Zealand? Is anybody else facing the same kind of issues? I mean, we know about seismic ratings for our own city buildings. So, A large number of our peer airports have had significant terminal developments over the last five years. So New Plymouth, Nelson, Napier. Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton have all done that. Hamilton was a significant issue um, seismically, and they responded reasonably quickly and uh, to the satisfaction of Air New Zealand and other uh, customers. Uh, but the other airports have, have upgraded their facilities and dealt with any potential issues uh, as they did that. Um, I want, can I have one more? Is that okay? Um, in the first report, it was covered about the marketing budget, and in this second report, you talked about what seemed to me the same thing, and you called it a social dividend in the second report. Are those the same thing, and why do we describe them in different ways in different reports? I guess marketing is the, the technical term for that, marketing and community engagement slash sponsorship. Um, the slide refers to it as a social dividend. To, to put it in the context is that that is our reinvestment back into the community um, in a similar way that a dividend, cash dividend is. It's, it's doing a similar thing, but just through a different channel. Thank you. Madam Chair. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to build off Councillor Bowen's line of question around Air New Zealand's requirements. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is Air New Zealand is our national carrier is required to fly to regional airports, so the threat that they would just simply up and stop flying to us, my understanding is isn't possible, but it, are you telling me that it is possible they could decide to not fly to us because we have a airport that isn't seismically condemned? I'm not certain of your first statement. Mm. Um, they have chosen not to fly to other airports. Okay. Uh, Northland being good examples of that. Uh, Wanganui. Um, so, uh, but they could they could still use the the uh, runway and uh, standing areas and whatever else and uh, go around. But we're only speculating. You know, we've opened an engagement with them, uh, doing so in a very transparent and uh, partnership arrangement. And uh, I'm certain that we will be able to uh, work out what is required. Um, you know, to, to our, our joint satisfactions. I appreciate that context, thank you. Um, regarding your dividend to debt chart that you showed us at the end of your um, <coughs> presentation, I'm trying to wrap my head around that when your debt is at the highest, you're comfortable paying a 40% dividend, but when your debt is at the lowest, aka this year and next year, you're not comfortable paying a dividend at all. I'm trying to understand how that works. How can you service that when your debt is at its peak, but not when the debt is at its lowest? I don't think we're suggesting that that is the likely scenario of what we will do. That is a scenario to demonstrate what revenue is likely to go down to over the next 10 years and what would happen to debt should we focus away from income diversification, which I don't think is, is the right choice, um, at the expense of paying it, in, in lieu of paying it, instead of paying a dividend. Um, so that is just one scenario that could play out should we choose to you know, adopt that sort of strategy. And that scenario had you paying down debt within the next 10 years? Uh, we, we're mindful. Uh, the council is a shareholder, and uh, if the shareholder is after certain um, aspects of dividend payments or whatever, we've got to be mindful of that. Um, appreciate that. Just a final question on my racket place, because there's been a lot of talk about how the terminal development overshadows your ability for income diversification. You've now developed, I believe it's eight sections there, two have been sold, one you're developing yourself, so that leaves five available to my account from what's available online. What happens to those sections, they sit dormant for the next 10 years, is that sort of effectively the plan and the statement of intent? Yes, uh, it, it is pretty much. Uh, our earlier indications were, uh, if we were looking this time 12 months ago, that we would be developing those with an intent to lease them, uh, you know, put a building and, and lease that. Um, that isn't possible at this point, except in very small sort of scale. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to go the Mayor, Councillor Hancock, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Naylor, then Councillor Arnott. Thanks, the Mayor. <laughs> thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, thanks again, gentlemen. And, and you've probably, I had a whole heap of questions and you've um, 
some of the other speakers have already got, um, got to them and you've answered quite a few of them already. Just a couple. So one, <coughs> one around um, the screening, which seems likely will happen at some stage, um, if you follow aviation, and, and the, the desire to get jets back. Invercargill have jets and they obviously tied in their terminal um, redevelopment to the return of jets. Are you going to do that as well? I, they obviously had some sort of agreement with Air New Zealand that they spent that money and they got the jet services back. Would we do that? Yes, the uh, return to jets, as I said earlier, isn't something that we can do alone and isn't something we can, as an airport, just wave a flag and be able to achieve. It requires a coordinated um, understanding and, and collaboration between Manawatu and organisations, including Te Tanganui screen, um Steering Group and CEDA. Uh, we are all working very closely, including with the people that assisted in Picargo to get jets down there um, to bring them here as well. Right, so there is a bit of a plan in the background to, to pull all that together. Very much so. So it's just not build a terminal, hope like heck the national carrier comes? No, not at all. Okay, cool. Just needed to make that obvious. Um, the, other, the other thing is, and, the, and you can sense it from some of my colleagues' questions, is the, the debt servicing and, and the debt that the airport company will be taking on. You touched on it, but probably didn't answer it and I'm going to tease this out, other options for capital raising. Council owns 100% of the airport shareholding. Is selling, or want your views on selling some shares and what that diversification can actually assist with, i.e. can it give it some cash, can it diversify some of our risk as well, can it bring on some partners, just welcome your views. It hasn't been a matter that we have actively debated. Um, we have had some discussions in general at the, uh, at the airport. Um, but this is entirely, again, uh, a matter for the shareholder uh, to consider uh, if they wish to hold 100% ownership of the airport or want to um, uh, sell down some aspect of that and I think it's important to note that the, the value of the airport uh, net assets now is over $80 million, and about 10 years ago it was $40 million. So there's a huge increase in wealth. That is an opportunity for the shareholder to take some money out by virtue of selling out uh, some of that shareholding. But that's entirely a, um, uh, a shareholder prerogative. We haven't at this point come to the shareholder and said that's something that we've uh, that we'd be recommending or asking the shareholder to consider uh, because at this stage we've been trying to, um, uh, I suppose, live within our means and not be overly aggressive as to uh, where we could go. Uh, but it is an option. It is an option. But you're not, you're not diversifying as much as you, you said yourself, you're not diversifying as much as you want to or can. Correct. Yeah. So uh, capital raising is a way of doing that, isn't it? Yes. Uh, at this point, we are contemplating how can we have income diversification with other partners, uh, which would probably be isolated to those particular assets, as we're thinking with the Zone D warehouse, that we'd be looking at an engagement with another partner uh, and sharing the risk on that investment alone, uh, rather than the whole of the company. So they'd, they'd, they'd become a partner, you'd, you'd set up a separate entity that just owns those buildings and they would be a partner in that with that's, you. That's likely uh, what, we, what we're thinking at this point, that it would be a subsidiary for a particular um, uh, asset owned separately or, you know, part by PNAL and part by someone else. Right, OK. I'll leave it there and allow others to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Hancock. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks, uh, Murray and Jonathan. Um, some of my questions have kind of sort of been touched on or, or answered, but um, my first one really is um, just, just a couple of uh, clarifications. Um, the SOI assumes a capital uh, development of 52 million. I'm just uh, wanting some reassurance around um, whether or not there's any contingency built into that. Um, and in terms of risk management, has there been any uh, third party uh, review of the risk management of that? 
I think there's contingency on contingency in some of those numbers. Um, the $40 million includes several million, I think it's at least $4 million of build contingency. There's escalation assumptions in there as well. There's design assumptions in there. So there's varying layers within the terminal cost that are contingency based. There's equally in the timing of the um, predicted spend of the terminal, uh, we are layered on additional layers of uh, contingency in there. So, for example, in the, uh, the, the way we've assumed that we will ramp up over the three years, we've assumed a, a heavier spend up front and a lighter spend towards the end, which, of course, means that more debt sooner means more interest sooner. Um, we did that because it allows slightly more flexibility within the SOI to pre-purchase materials if that option came available um, at a cheaper rate. But it may not be how it turns out. It is just another layer of, of really a contingency. So, yes, it has been factored in. And in terms of any third party auditive? Thing. Yes, yes, we have all, all along the way our, our quantity survey our auditors has been in, involved in all of the meetings. So um, they originally worked with the architect when it came back at the $60 million and it um, was very quickly kicked to touch and said that's not an option, go find a much simpler, a simpler option. Um, in every meeting that's subsequently been held with the architect, uh, the quantity survey has been there every step of the way, yes. Great, thank you. Um, Oh, we've also had third party um, input from um, structural engineers, geotech engineers, et cetera, all validating uh, yeah, third party review of our detailed seismic assessment, because obviously a lot of this cost hinges on the terminal seismic strength. Um, we wanted to make very sure that that is an accurate uh, ref representation of where we're at today, so we've sort of peer review on that DSA. Okay, thank you. Um, and now th my next question is really just about uh, clarification, and that's in terms of uh, the ability to take uh, larger aircraft. Uh, my understanding is that the threshold for us required to have screening, both passengers and, and baggage, is 90 passengers per aircraft. Is that correct? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, and my last question is just really around um, just getting some comment from you, just in terms of the warehousing part of that um, um, capital development and its links to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Utanga, to, to Utanga Nui. Mm -hmm. And just uh, perhaps just expand on that, the dependency there. So uh, freight and logistics, uh, the airport is within Te Utanga Nui, and freight and logistics is obviously a very key focus of, of, of that um, development. So um, within our business park, we have a master plan. Uh, the master plan is areas which are sort of designated towards light industrial or others that are specifically for uh, freight and logistics. That northern side of Airport Drive is sort of the golden land for anything sort of aviation, freight and logistics related. Uh, that's what these warehouses would be. The types of tenants that we're putting into there where we are either about to sign or have signed up pre-leasing, because again we're, we're taking the most risk adverse approach here in terms of not committing to anything until we've got leases in place. Um, they're either new tenants specifically within the logistics space who aren't on the airport campus today but are people who we would very much like to have there or they're existing tenants in that space who require more land um, or more operational space and we don't want to risk losing them to you know, the centre of town, for example, when they fit very well within Te Tanganui. Thanks, John. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Murray, Jonathan and and Cam. Um, so um, my questions are around the, uh, the debt repayment, I suppose. And uh, you've just shown us a couple of graphs there of a 10-year horizon. Have you got detailed 10-year financial modelling? Yes, that's based on a de detailed 10-year model. OK. Would you be able to provide that to us? I'm sure we could, yes. Okay. Um, so when do you think that the airport would be in a position to repay the debt? There are many assumptions that go into that, um, that model I produced on screen earlier had an assumption in there that we'd pay $18 million of dividend over the 10 years and we'd be at $30 million of debt. If you took $18 million of dividend away and you put that onto the debt repayment, you'd be down to $10 million odd of debt within 10 years. Um, so it really depends on where we put the levers, how much capital expenditure we want to spend on income diversification versus debt reduction versus um, dividend payments. Those three levers uh, will all dictate where, how quickly we come back down. In reality, it may be the best scenario to, to not look at bringing it back down too quickly and instead invest that debt reduction into that income diversification, which was our sort of original intention 12, 18 months ago. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so, in terms of um, the risk going forward uh, of not diversifying at this point, but putting the loan into the terminal development, that puts the airport heavily reliant on increasing passenger numbers for income, as you showed in your graph. So, if there were to be, I don't know, an, another pandemic and um, a crash in passenger numbers for whatever reason, which, you know, we <laughs> would have seemed probably unthinkable 10 years ago, but now we have to think about these things. What's, what's your risk mitigation? What risk mitigation have you got in place for that scenario? There's a variety of levers that can be pulled if we were ever in a situation like that again. Um, there are the obvious things around OPEX that you would really look to, to adjust as you can. Much of our OPEX is fixed or preventative maintenance, um, but some of those could be deferred. Um, but really the biggest one I think that you could, the lever that we would be forced to pull if we were in, put in such a, an uncomfortable position would be to reconsider our strategy around land sales. Um, it isn't a a priority and isn't something we wish to achieve because it, it has a short-term uh, cash injection for a 50-year cost, um, but it is something that you could buy your way out of debt relatively quickly. Um, there are com complications around airport drive. Uh, we've talked, touched about that, if that was an option. Um, but there is cash sitting there in terms of existing land that could be you know, liquidated, should it need to be. Um, Murray, have you got any other? Yes, the board did ask management to, um, I suppose, prioritise, assess in the first instance parcels of, of or assets that could be um, sold, and we assigned a priority to those. So there are assets there, um, and we had to be comfortable that they existed as well and that the opportunities were there before we could uh, go any further. Not that we've committed to um, a construction um, a contract yet, but we needed to know that, and yes, we have got it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I guess have um, you you're, you've sort of indicated in your presentation that you've fully explored all other options for the terminal redevelopment. Um, but are there really no choices about timing? level of investment, um, you know, because if you were to uh, delay some aspects of the terminal redevelopment and instead put the capital into income diversification, would that not put you in a better position going forward than investing your, your, your limited loan facility in the terminal redevelopment, which puts you on the back foot for years, as, as, as you've demonstrated? Granted, it's an aeronautical base of revenue as opposed to a non-aeronautical base of revenue, but the terminal does ultimately pay its way, um, mostly. It is a slower bubble up than what you would get from a proper, probably a lease property, but through landing charges, uh, through higher lease income in the terminal, we do recover much of the cost that we have to spend on the terminal. So it isn't a, a, a typical public building where we may not see any sort of recovery on that cost. There is a recovery there. Um, is there any? Sorry, if you can repeat your question, I might have something more to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't want to get a comment, but but it seems to me that the choices are between um, spending capital on income diversification and developing the industrial side of things, versus spending money on the terminal. And from the figures you put forward the consequence of spending money on the terminal rather than the, the industrial side of things makes you reliant on increasing passenger numbers for increasing income for the foreseeable future. Has um, he, has, do you think he's answered that? Well, no, I don't. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but, but maybe I wasn't very clear in my questioning. Okay. So I suppose the question is, how can we be sure that this is the best way to spend the loan that you're drawing down? Um, there, are, there are probably several ways uh, you could look at that. One would be uh, the experience for the customer, and you go, yes, but how do we value that? And um, uh, then we might 
we might also have to look at what are our customers' expectations, and that's why we're engaging very much with Air New Zealand uh, right now. We'll also need to look from a um, governor's view of what are the assets we've got and um, do these need to be a strengthened, you know, I'm talking about the terminal itself, do we need to strengthen that um, to ensure that they are safer than they are now? And at this stage, we believe we do need to do that, but we are being driven by um, information which is more new to us than, than we were here last year. We didn't have it uh, last year when we were here. We are seeking third party um, peer reviews on those so that we are not going to be making a decision uh, based on one report alone, uh, that it has some justification, some solid um, footing, if you'd excuse the pun, um, underneath it. So it then becomes a question of, is this about finance uh, and income uh, diversification, or is this about providing a gateway um, uh, through our our community and the various other economic benefits that flow from it. And uh, our assessment at this stage, the board's assessment, is that the terminal development is a higher priority than income diversification, albeit um, it's harder to uh, measure the outputs, the outcomes. As Jonathan said, we do get paid for it, but it's a slow payment and it comes over a long period of time and it isn't as fast and convenient as if we were to invest in, um, in industrial buildings. If I could please add one little thing to that, just to say that the risk exists there today whether we spend the money or not, um, and if we don't spend the money today addressing the terminal ish risk, uh, it only grows in terms of the cost to do it in five years' time will be higher than what it is today. In the worst case scenario, if we had a seismic event and you know the terminal became unusable, we would be having to rebuild at a time where um, we're competing for resource with everybody else and we've got no flights coming in because we don't have a terminal. So by doing it in a controlled and measured and, and appropriate timeline now, it, it reduces the risk of being in a situation where we have no terminal and no income. OK, I'll just get one more. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so I guess the fundamental question is, what is the justification that we can uh, support ratepayers accepting the risks of this, foregoing dividends and providing this, this funding arrangement into the future? What's, what's your justification or your return proposition that we can explain to ratepayers why we're doing this? So Jonathan showed a slide earlier which uh, had the justifications on it. Uh, and there was about eight, eight different points, I, I believe, and we can always get those back if, if that's what you're after. Um, but the, the, uh, the rate payer is not being asked to, um, to put any more money into this. Uh, there are, because we're not asking for capital, uh, there is a return of dividends in our SOI, uh, so there is a, a, a return of that. Uh, so it really comes down to are we managing the risk as best as we believe we can and the airport board believes that we are, that we need to attend to this um, at the expense of investment in um, industrial um, uh, properties. I'll leave it there then, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Um, Councillor Naylor, online. She froze them. Give me OK. Go, Councillor Naylor. We can hear you. Just, just ask the question. Councillor Naylor's question is, why is social, the social dividend being prioritised over financial dividends? Is this 1.2 million value over the next three years? And when do they hear back? Okay, I'll just ask that because there's another question after that. 
So the question was, why is the social dividend being prioritised over, over the financial, the financial dividend. dividend? I don't think that's quite the case. Is they they have different purposes there. Obviously, cash dividend comes into uh, to council directly. Um, the social dividend uh, speaks to the statement of expectation and the council goals that we are asked to comply with. So, for example. Um, one of the goals is around an innovative and growing city. So, uh, you know, our sponsorship and involvement with the Business Awards and UCOL fits within that. Uh, we're asked to comply with the creative and exciting city. Our investment with Centrepoint Drag Fest, the various sports and community groups, the arena, the mini golf, all fit within that. So it's not that we're prioritising it, it's that we're being asked to complete a set of criteria under the SOE, and we are, to the best of our ability, doing that. Also important to note with, with that community engagement side of things, a social licence to us is absolutely critical. We are a 24-7 airport with um, noise being generated from aircraft 24-7. We must have a strong social licence with our community. One way that we engage and um, develop that licence is, is through our own community engagement projects. Okay. Councillor Nella, can you still hear us? Okay, I'll just keep asking you next question because I don't think. Is there. Yes, I can. Oh, good. You're on your next question about when did you hear back from Air New Zealand regarding their preferences? Thank you. Uh, we, I think Murray touched on, we had a meeting with Air New Zealand within the last two weeks where we have um, clarified their expectations around the terminal redevelopment and what is tolerable to them. Okay, and your final question, Councillor Naylor? Okay, I'm going to read your final question out. What is the timing of the, um, the airport becoming aware of the seismic issues? When did you find out the 34.5%? Hmm. I'll be exactly sure. Um, was pre-Christmas, uh, and hence we've asked for the detailed seismic assessment <laughs> details and a peer review on it. Um, but if you want the exact date, we could we could find that. But it, it was certainly it hasn't been while we've been uh, sitting in in the chamber here. Uh, some 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 time between then and now, uh, pre-Christmas. So. Great. Any follow-up questions, Councillor Naylor? Okay, I can't, I don't think there's any communication there. Thank you, Councillor Naylor. I hope I answered them okay. okay I've got two more questioners. There's Councillor Arnott and Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Madam Chair and Chamber. Good morning. Um, I had seven questions. You'll be relieved to know most of those have been answered, and I'm happy with that. Thank you for your reports. Um, back in the day, obviously with Freedom, there was infrastructure with, with International and JETS so forth, and I, I remember vividly coming back from Melbourne and, and being stopped in customs, the lucky third person, and, and was most concerned when the gloves went on. Um, it was just a fresh search, though. So, so just a question, question. Councillor. question Anna. is, where did the infrastructure go back in the day for that? So the infrastructure for that uh, was mostly on our eastern uh, wing, and uh, the upstairs area there is now the new, uh, or the, not, can't be that new, uh, Air New Zealand Regional Lounge has taken uh, virtually all of that upstairs area behind the cafe. And downstairs has become the baggage carousels uh, for baggage collection. So as numbers of passengers increased, and that was even after the uh, international time, as domestic passenger increased, we needed to expand the, uh, the, um, uh, the footprint uh, for our, our, our passenger numbers. That's where it's gone. Right, thank you. Roughly how many employees are there at the airport? Uh, in the corporate side of space, including customer service, we've got about 16, and I think there are about eight in the rescue fire team as well. Right, okay, thank you. I'd like to know about any recent research, if any, with sharing Hakia's infrastructure. You know, over the years, it was mooted um, to use a haki for inter international travel. Um, and in 2015, they built a 5,800 metre square terminal with all the bells and whistles, which cost 12 million. Um, our airport wanting to build 
5,200 metre square terminal for 40 million. Um, Haki's terminals, North Island's. Quick question. Has, so I'm interested to know what discussions, if any, um, P&A hours had with the Haki and um, back in the day, why wasn't this infrastructure that sits there doing nothing pushed at the time to be built in Palmerston So North? the question is, have there been any discussions with? Correct. Thank you. The only discussions we've had have been historical uh, and, it's a bit, and uh, sometimes driven by other parties, such as could uh, we share a uh, facility uh, with Ahakia? And the response has been uh, from defence, no. Uh, that's a defence um, asset. And I think that would be best um, illustrated when uh, a year or so ago a diversion, international diversion, was parked there and they sat on the terminal until it could take off and go somewhere else. Um, it wouldn't be a particularly good for Palmerston North City anyway if we had to travel that way. We have a fantastic asset sitting right here at the north of our city and uh, much more accessible. Thank you. Um, with Palmerston North Airport being the ninth busiest in the country with numbers, um, do you think with new roading and whatnot to Wellington and um, times reduced, do you think um, that might have any effect on our airport in due course? Yes, in fact, it may be beneficial. Uh, there's a, a large catchment around uh, Carpety uh, that has historically, we believe, accessed Wellington Airport, um, whereas if the roading northwards uh, is improved, as it is uh, planned to do so, some of it's already been done and further uh, to north of, uh, uh, north of uh, Levin, uh, that will encourage or, or enable more passengers to come here. The road in equally across the gorge uh, will help those in the Tarua and Central Hawke's Bay uh, to come this way as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Madam Chair. Thanks, Councillor Arnott. Finally, Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and with appreciation to colleagues for doing much of the heavy lifting, just a couple points left. Uh, Marie, if I can just ask further around your assumptions around people wanting to drive um, from Kapiti up here. Do we have good data on price sensitivity? Because less often, fares are much higher out of this airport than Wellington. Um, it's pretty hard to get on a... Um, on a uh, objective basis. We can do so by collecting data as we have done over the years uh, across the, the schedule and said this is our price point uh, as advertised at a certain time, you know, three weeks ahead of flying or something and that's their uh, price and so on. Uh, it does vary and I'm certain, but I can't be certain uh, myself, but I, I would think that Air New Zealand is quite aware of the numbers and where they can push their, uh, their aircraft and maximise their loads, and therefore the pricing will be reflective of that. If we have an opportunity here to um, have Air New Zealand as um, uh, a partner into the future as they are now, we work very close with them. If they think this is a good terminal and a good um, experience for their customers, then that must be beneficial for future pricing, I would have thought, but I can't be certain. Uh, thanks for that. So to Clarify then the the forecast that you're providing us of passenger numbers. Is that predicated on people from the Kapiti Coast travelling up here? Uh, no, it's based on the volumes of aircraft that are going to fly. So whether it's 11, 12, 13 to Auckland a day, uh, as opposed to about the 11 that there is. Um, so it's not predicated necessarily on people coming here from Kapiti. Uh, it's a 90 minute drive market. Is where we as our as our general catchment. So. Um, and it is just general, the return to flying that we're seeing post-COVID. Thank you. Um, you talked about your detailed seismic um, report having been supplied to Air New Zealand. Has that been supplied as well to the City Council? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Finally, um, just wanted to really understand around the 36 million and the scope there. Um, is that a, a seismic kind of plus, or is that just seismic? So this is the <coughs> excuse me. This is the 36 million rebuild cost to get us back to just just a seismic, not to address the you know the 40 million that we've talked to to here. 
Um, that is a like-for-like like rebuild with an 80% NBS rating. So it's it's not 100% NBS. No, sorry, I'm, I'm not asking about rebuild. I'm asking about the refurbishment option. There's yes. that refurbishment sorry, option. A, re a refurb to 80% of current NBS. Right, and if there's a difference of that 80% versus other percentages, how price sensitive is that? A new build would be 100% because um, I think that's the, the requirement. We haven't looked at a lower rating on a, a refurbish option. In New Zealand have a minimum of 67% that they require. Um, but we do know that the NBS ratings are changing, so what is 80 today is not necessarily going to be 80 in another year's time. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. People keep creeping back into the crew. Q, I've got two further questions from Councillor um, Naila. Uh, her internet's gone down, so that's why she's not online. Um, Council indicated an expectation the dividend to be reinstated progressively within the next two years. This is not reflected in the SOI. Why is that? It's been reflected in... Um in the SOI that it would be paid after the third year of the SOI. Uh, prior to that, it was the board's belief that it wasn't prudent to pay it, uh, given the, uh, the level of debt, and that would be better to wait until the third year. Okay, thank you for that answer. If Council's preference is for the financial dividend to be prioritised over the social dividend um, of 1.2 million, how do we best communicate that? I believe you do so after discussion around our SOI and say what is it that you want to see uh, specifically uh, and how that might vary from what we've done. And, and as Jonathan said, uh, what, we, what we've really looked at is your statement of expectations and if we've misinterpreted that, then uh, we're, we're certainly open to, to understanding where, where, we've, where we've misinterpreted it. <coughs> Thank you. That was from Councillor Naylor. Councillor Arnott, you're back. Apologies for coming back. Um, just one other final question. It wasn't too long ago that you had plans to extend the runway to obviously allow bigger planes, I guess. Um, where does that plan now sit and what sort of cost is there for that? There are no plans to do that within sort of 20, 30 years. Um, it is a long-term <laughs> play to extend the runway across Milson Line. The only reason you would need that is if you were having wide-body aircraft coming onto the airfield. Um, that would really only be for uh, international air freight. There is a lot of room to grow the narrow body uh, freight aircraft which can arrive today before you need to even consider that. Did you ever have any costings for that? I don't have that number, sorry. Okay, thank you. Finally, and then we're gonna have morning tea. Councillor Finlay, you're holding us up from morning tea. <laughs> Just sitting there listening to your assumptions about the future of the airport and one assumption sort of got me thinking slightly. Now, you're saying people from Kapiti will come to Palmerston North when or if the new roading is going. My question is, why would people from Kapiti come to Palmerston North to fly when it's so much more expensive than what it is from Wellington? Uh, yeah, I don't know if they can answer that question, Councillor Finlay. It's um, a hypothetical question. But the important thing to note is we haven't factored in any huge increase or anything. We haven't factored in an increase uh, due to that. Okay. Right. You are released. <laughs> We're going to have morning tea. 15 minutes, everybody. So it is uh, 22. We'll see you back at 5 to 11. Thanks, everybody. Sorry, Cedar. Straight.
Okay, we're going to look to um, move these recommendations. Um, the first one is that the committee receive the Palms North Airport Limited um, draft statement of intent for 23-24 to 25-26. Presented to the economic... Am I on the right paper? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> economic Growth Committee, uh, April 12-23, and that the Palms North Airport... Um, Limited be advised that the Council support the proposed direction and implementation strategy and the Council suggests that the targeted and for tangible net worth be increased from 50 to 80 million that the Council recognise the projected requirements for loans totalling 31 million by 30 June 2024 and that the Palms North Airport Limited will be seeking to utilise the loan facility provided by the City Council by the council to be to a fund to significant proportion of, for this. This is moved by the mayor and seconded by me. And now we'll move into comment. There are other recommendations coming up after this, so we'll just do this. Deal with this recommendation first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, colleagues, look, and thank you to again to John and Murray for very thorough questions that were. Um, uh, you answered extremely well. And I'd have to say I came into the chamber thinking something different. And uh, I think you um, answered and allayed my personal um, fears of where we were heading um, really well. So I thank you for that. Um, councillors, this is all around, and before I start, could we just change the word on B, council um, adjusts rather than suggests the target? because actually it will be an $80 million tangible net worth um, asset. So that's just a bit of um, housekeeping, really. Um, so, councillors, look, I can sense the questions around debt, um, perhaps priorities, but this is all around managing risk at the end of the day. And what is the real risk here? The risk is, if we don't do something, nobody's coming. That's the seriousness of it. And you just need to look at um, other airports that have upgraded, and I'm not saying we're following, the, following everybody else, but we are a bit of the last cab off the rank in this, in this regional game. Um, but we are a significant airport. You know, we, we are, have a vision, or the airport has a vision, um, of being New Zealand's leading regional airport. And I think it's, the risk here is more than just... Um, fixing the terminal, there's the diversification, but actually, if we don't get jets back here, there is a lack of diversification because the freight that goes in the bellies of uh, Air New Zealand uh, jets uh, actually decreases our um, viability as a freight hub. So it ties in perfectly to our Te Utanganui Central New Zealand distribution hub. Um, the airport is a critical partner in that. I sense and share some of the sentiment around the debt, around the costs, but actually we know ourselves and some of the work that we've been doing ourselves in this, in this earthquake strengthening um, business that it, it is quite volatile. Um, we're better to do the work now. Um, I trust that the airport company and their um, consultants have gone through this pretty thoroughly. I, only thing I would say to them is please share things with us as, as quickly as you can. And um, I think you've got a sense that um, our councillors are eager to understand the business of the airport, perhaps more than they were in previous terms. Um, and I think that's because we value the work um, that the airport does and also the gateway aspect of it. We've spoken about um, pricing and, and, and perhaps the cup of tea and uh, aspect of the market. But actually, if jets come, that makes us more attractive as well. So it's not all about um, jets in the terminal. We spoke, um, or the, uh, um, the airport spoke about uh, the new warehousing and looking for partners. And actually, council could be a partner in that. Just putting it out there. We could be absolutely a partner, and that way it enables it to happen quickly. It, there's a win-win for everybody. We get a return on it. Uh, we can allow a buyback to the airport company. And actually, it makes the thing happen very quickly. 
and and it, I think it's the right thing to do for uh, a shareholder to show some real interest in in the um, company that we own. So, councillors, I ask you to. I don't think we've got a lot of choice. We could lie this on the table and we could have another discussion, but I think we'd just be going over the same old ground. So in that case, I do think um, we trust our governance board, we trust our management in the airport, and uh, we look to um, allow them to get on with things uh, and, and move to the next stage. And um, so I ask you to support this, please. Thank you. Councillor Denison. Uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm, uh, make some comments before I say um, my views on this. I, I do have some reservations in the fact that um, I believe that we should be prompted to have a discussion ourselves as shareholder whether that we have an open mind or consideration to expand the shareholding. I think that is a decision for us to have and, um, and perhaps we should lead that out because ultimately I'd rather see a cash injection at the shareholder level rather than going down to some of these projects that are actually fundamental to the diversification strategy when we're doing a partnership proposition for the development on the site. And for my mind, when you go to partner in those type of um, projects around the development on the site, when you partner proportionally with the investment, you're only going to get a proportional return. And that's that's one of the fundamental focuses of the diversification strategy. So I don't think we should be splitting the return at that level. I'd rather see it at a shareholder level. That's, that's the first point I'd make. So I think we can have that discussion concurrently to the SOI. Um, the other point around um, the presentation that was emphasising the size of the community investment, which is the sponsorship essentially, uh, being interpreted that the SOI gives direction in that regard. I think that's an a interpretation that may not have been um, intended. But nevertheless, the rationale for having that community investment, understanding they've got a 24-hour operation that has noise and other impacts, that it does make sense to have some alignment and, and investment into the community. The level of the 1.2 million over three years is, is a question mark for me whether that could be reconsidered and sort of exited out and made it more... Uh, more prudent approach considering the other large investment that's required. So that was the second point I just wanted to give some reflection back on. Uh, the other one that's been a little bit silent in questions is the vesting of the road. When we're talking over the next short period, uh, a figure of nine to ten million of upgrading the carriageway. And in the fact that we are the 100% shareholder, I think there is a conversation still to be had around vesting that road into the city and taking that requirement to upgrade that sort of investment into, the, um, into that roadway uh, as, as a secondary point that I think that we need to have concurrently. Again, it can take place, but rather than seeing it as a risk of setting some sort of precedent uh, that's wider, um, I think that the fact that we're the 100% shareholder, I think that is a real sound consideration for us to have a fair discussion about. That's the third point. But ultimately, um, we are wanting to position ourselves, and we are actually the logistics and freight hub of the central North Island. And the airport is a key um, strategic um, component of that. And it's fair that they haven't asked for investment for recent years, and this is a reasonable amount to invest. And the fact that the security and the earthquake aspects and all the other listed components are needed, I think the Mayor's quite right in reflection. This is something we just need to do. Uh, and so therefore, with those comments leading out on that, um, is not being understated. I think they are very important issues to make sure that it's not fundamentally flawed going forward. Um, I'm happy to support these recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I go to another councillor, I'm just going to comment. Um, I am going to support these recommendations. And just remember there are two other recommendations to come after these two. Um, the reason I am is because is this is our significant asset for the city, and we do want the jets to return. And I think when it questioned, they did say that if we didn't upgrade the terminal, we wouldn't get the jets back, and we do need the jets back into the city. We need the jets so that we can get the passengers, but we can get more freight. So 
that is one of my key reasons for supporting these two recommendations. Um, and the second thing about vesting of the road, we've actually already, as us as councillors know, that we've already asked the CE to look into this. So the CE is actually looking into this for us. So we've already gone down that track with the CE. So hopefully we'll get a response back from the CE about the vesting of the road. But I will support these two. We'll now go to Councillor Hancock. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And uh, a lot of points have already been made. Um, Obviously, the airport is um, a critical asset to the city, and um, and, and the reality is, is that we actually own it. Um, nobody else does. Uh, so I think it's up to, to us to ensure that we uh, don't um, purposefully put um, roadblocks in the way to the, uh, the development of uh, a key asset for the city. Uh, the other point I was going to make is that um, screening capability must precede larger aircraft. That's a legal responsibility, not a responsibility of choice. Um, the warehousing development is uh, keyed into the Te Utanga Nui um, development. And there are many, many, many strands to the freight hub uh, development for the Lower North Island. So that becomes also very important in terms of the prosperity of the city and also the region. Um, like others, I was. I understand the size of the, the the amount of investment required for this, and I think the questioning from all councillors really sort of, um, I think, uncovered the fact that um, both the board and the um, and the executive of the airport have actually put uh, quite a bit of diligence into the process of making sure that. Uh, we take as much of the risk out of this particular investment as we possibly can. So uh, I am going to support this and I urge others to do so also. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues. It has been an interesting uh, morning of questions and, and comments so far. Um, just to let you know where I've gotten to on this, I feel that it is... Um, quite a significant and, and in some ways radical change from, from where we were only months ago. Um, and I, while I acknowledge there's some information that has been presented to us this morning and answers to questions to support things, I, I'm still um, feeling quite cautious about this. Um, I guess a couple things by way of example, it was helpful having um, Councillor Arnott ask about um, Milson Lyon, because I remember reading um, plenty in the paper at that time around how it was mission critical, it was essential, it was urgent, etc. We're 10 years down the track now, not even on the radar. And while I acknowledge that there is um, work that needs to be done, I would much um, prefer us take a slower approach that had a, it's ultimately a bit more optioneering in it around how we um, tackled it. You know, we've got a building out there. And, and that building you know, used to be able to handle jets, well in excess of 100 passengers, all the biosecurity screening, all the passport screening, and all the luggage handling. And I'm, I'm really struggling to see how we need um, to go into a, a total rebuild when we've actually got, to my mind, um, space that could be, could be repurposed. And it's ultimately quite a bit of my concern and quite a bit of the, the caution that I feel really is is around the kind of future for air transport and the extent to which we um, continue a business as usual approach. So we've been in, um, uh, Mayor gave us a good history lesson of how long it's been going on. You know, in kind of every one of those years, it's been about maximizing, maximizing, maximizing. I'm not convinced that the future of air travel is a maximizing story. I think it's an optimizing story. It's a question of flying when we need to and being much more upfront about the emissions and the related environmental footprint of that choice of travel versus other choices of travel. So it's probably a, you know, a kind of broader um, concern underpinning um, this whole area of, of Council's endeavors. Um, and where I'm at in terms of this is I'm not really um, comfortable at this point voting um, to support um, what's in front of us. I'll be um, voting against this and hopefully that's um, sufficient by way of reason so that people can understand where that's coming from. Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Councillor Bowen. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak to say um, thank you to the Airport Board for walking us through that um, really thoughtfully and carefully. I think what's been most useful to me was putting um, this draft statement of intent in that 10-year context of seeing what that means <coughs> going forward to the, the debt profile and also the dividend profile for, for council. Um, but then looking back 10 years as well to see this as part of yeah, the long story that the mayor alluded to that Palmerston North Airport has had. Um, and the world has, has changed a great deal in the last, since we last had jets here. Um, I'm afraid I have to disagree with Councillor Barrett to say we could repurpose. I think I asked that question and the airport um, board were really clear that the current building does not allow for repurposing to meet the current requirements of jet flight in and out of Palmerston North. So um, one way or another, that is a question we're going to have to answer. Um, and I say we, because as Councillor Hancock said, yeah, we own the airport. This is a decision um, for us as their shareholders, say, do we support the proposal that they've brought to us? And I've appreciated the thoughtfulness that's gone into that, the, the um, options that have been looked at. And I think that was um, something I, I really found useful today in helping me come to this position of knowing um, why things have changed so much over the last couple of years. Um, but we, we know from our own experience in city centre, buildings that the earthquake strengthening issues are difficult. I think it's likely that this conversation will change again as plans are made, more investigation is done. I, I, yeah, I think we've all learned that lesson, that this is, this is a really difficult conversation. But the plans in front of us today seem like a sensible step into that. And so I'll be supporting the, the recommendations that are there. And I'll be interested to see what the other ones that are coming are. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make was about the um, what's been described variously as the marketing budget or social dividend, depending on which report it turns up in. Um, and I think it was a good, good comment well made about social license, that the airport has to be conscious um, that they operate not just by the customers who actually use the airport, which is a small percentage of our community, but by license of our whole community for the impact that that has on our surrounding environment. And so that social dividend actually does function as marketing. Um, and if we reduce what they're calling social dividend, I think all that would happen is their marketing budget would increase because it's just calling the same thing. It's highlighting the outcomes in a different way. And I, I can't see the point of us doing that. So I'm very comfortable with where we're sitting at the moment and actually I'm very grateful to Palmerston North Airport for the com community support that they do provide. I think it does work to help people feel the value of having an airport, even if they're not flyers. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barn. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I have to say, you know, I have some sympathy for the airport. Um, for the situation that they find themselves in uh, around the earthquake strengthening and the need to pivot on previous plans away from diversifying the industrial areas and into uh, terminal redevelopment. Um, am I uh, convinced that that's the right thing to do at this stage? I feel as though I don't have enough information to make that call. Um, what I would like to feel more comfortable is to see the detailed 10-year financials um, to, because um, I think as the, the CFO uh, conceded, the, th the three years that we're looking at uh, don't look great, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, would, I also need to be convinced that there is absolutely no other option than going for a $40 million rebuild on the, on the terminal development. Um, the level of risk that is involved in uh, deferring the income diversification, um, focusing solely on the terminal redevelopment at the expense of that, um, I think that strategically as a city we will suffer from that in the longer term. And um, it's a wasted opportunity. Uh, and 
in terms of how we're aiming to, to have the Te Tanganui project up and running, it, it, it isn't aligned. So I'm, I'm not really supportive of the proposed direction in this statement of intent. And I would like to see more information to be convinced that there is no other option. And I'd also like to see some exploration of other means of continuing to do the diversification of the industrial development uh, alongside the terminal redevelopment or possibly even a little ahead of that if there is some leeway with the, with the spend on the terminal. I mean, we as a council are well aware of cost escalation. Um, and some of our um, projects, uh, the cost between us um, signing them off and them actually being delivered, uh, the cost has, has been well more than 10% in, in terms of escalation. Sometimes it's been 25%, sometimes it's been 50%. And so it worries me that the $40 million could easily turn into $60 million, um, quite easily. And then where, where would we be? Where would the airport be? Um, so that, I think, that's a significant risk. Um, and I'm just, I'm uncomfortable, I suppose, with the, uh, with the value proposition that's been outlined to us. And so, um, I mean, I have got a, an additional rec recommendation in, but my preferred option at this stage would be for us to uh, defer approving the statement of intent until it's significantly amended and until we've got substantially more information so that we're able to be um, as sure as we can be that this is the right direction. So, so, um, so Councillor, this is just the draft, though, so... Yes, sorry, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you, sorry. Yes, yes, I'm aware it's the draft, but if we're, if, if we're voting to approve uh, that we support the proposed direction and, and so on, then we're voting to approve the draft, aren't we, effectively? It's my understanding. So, I mean, I'm not happy with the draft. That's what I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to explain why and what could be done uh, to make me happy with the draft, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, I mean, I think, as I say, I'm not unsympathetic to the bind that the airport finds itself in, and I, I totally understand the requirements around having, um, you know, an earthquake-safe uh, building as opposed to, opposed to an earthquake-prone building. But I just think the... The proposed direction here, the proposed solution to the problem is not one that I currently can feel comfortable with. And if I have detailed financial information for 10 years, and if I um, can see a business case around the terminal that there really is absolutely no other option, and I can see that there's some other proposal for enabling the diversification to continue, um, then that will be a different story. I think I've made my point, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to make a little point that, as far as I'm aware, screening and whatnot would only apply to people, it wouldn't apply to freight, as we already have a jet leaving most nights from our tarmac. Um, also, you know, I do have concerns as well with cost blowouts. Um, I would certainly like to see more emphasis on partnerships, um, and, you know, a lot more sort of done in that sort of area. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McAllard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to uh, add into the debate and uh, agree with the Mayor and Councillor uh, Hancock, uh, no doubt that the airport is an asset to our city, and uh, I believe that supporting this recommendation uh, will facilitate the growth of air services and regional um, economic activity, um, and as well as reinforce our role as the primary freight and logistic hub for the lower North um, Island region. I also agree with the um, airport um, that our present facility is not fit for purpose, um, and I don't personally, I personally believe that it's not, econo um, that it's not econo economically viable to undertake refurbishment due to seismic and geotechnical constraints. Um, 
So I will be voting in favor of this because I believe that it's in our best interest to increase the terminal capacity. And also on the issue of uh, bag screening, uh, whether we like it or not, somewhere in the future we'll actually have to do this if we want to attract jets into a city. It's a must and it will happen if we want to continue to be, if we want to become a logistic hub and uh, be a big player in that space. It will happen at some stage, so um, I don't see a problem with that. So we need to move in that direction, be more proactive in our approach. Um, I also acknowledge uh, the concerns raised by uh, fellow councillors around the cost, our blowout in cost. But I also see it differently in, a, differently in the sense that if we do not do it now or be proactive in doing it now, it's going to cost us more in the future to do the very same job. So I'll leave it to this, and I'll say and encourage fellow councillors to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's two more speakers. Just remember there's two other recommendations that cover costs and other things, so I'll just leave that there. Councillor Fitzgerald. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, my colleague, our colleagues will, uh, will know that I'm not alone in thinking this is all going to be about a dividend back to our ratepayers when the papers came out. I certainly was in that camp. I certainly didn't have a clear understanding of the development potential um, on the site. Uh, but thanks to the report delivered today by the airport company, we've got a clearer picture now that we've got a, an asset that has a tangible net value of $80 million. We've got a choice between a $36 million refurb versus a $40 million brand new build. The fact that the international lounge structure doesn't exist anymore and negates the uh, possibility of being, the jets being able to utilise the structure or the asset that we have now. The detailed seismic assessment is nothing new to the commercial development world um, and that's probably one of the, the biggest or the heaviest loads for the airport company to bear but I'm very heartened that rather than getting a second DSA or considering getting a second DSA, they've instead brought in a third party peer review um, to look at the detailed, the detail of the DSA. And last but not least, you know, the airport company also has a board of directors and governors and it's their job um, to oversee what happens with our shareholding in the company's assets. So, I will be supporting these recommendations. Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. And lastly, Councillor Naylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I won't be supporting the current draft statement. We can't hear you. Do you want um, to speak up a bit? Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, I won't be supporting the draft statement of t intent. I do have some concerns about the level of... Um, investment into the terminal development and the timing of that. And certainly I'm not convinced that all other um, options have been explored in, in, in as far as I, I can, I've heard to date. Um, I, I would prefer an amended um, statement of intent and I think we do need to have the opportunity to give that further direction. Um, I'm also not comfortable with the dividend policy that is has been included in the statement of intent, and I don't believe it reflects the clear direction that council gave late last year for that dividend to be reinstated progressively within the next two years. Um, I'd like, um, even if even if that what what is progressively means a small a small amount to start with, I think that would show an indication towards um, being mindful of shareholder expectations and reflecting that. Um, I think the social licence of our community, I think when we're thinking about that, we need to be mindful that since the suspension of the dividend, um, our community have been having to pay increased rates as a result of that. And that is at a, at a time where many in our community have got many financial challenges. So um, my view is that if we went to our community and said, would you rather a financial dividend or would you rather a social dividend? My view is that most people would prefer um, not to be having to pay that additional rates. Um, and I think the the outworking of council's vision and goals 
is primarily our responsibility and I think we outwork that through our annual budget. My expectation is not that um, the airport would have to do that quite as explicitly as they've outlined with a very long list of um, sponsors. So those are my main reasons. I, I share the views that Councillor Johnson and Councillor Barrett have already expressed. Um, so I won't be I won't be supporting it in its current form and I, I would prefer some adjustments. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Naylor. Right of reply? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and acknowledge um, the caution of a few of the councillors. Um, and um, But I would say this plan hasn't really changed except for some of the factors that are, um, are forcing uh, the airport company in terms of the earthquake and, some, and, and the corresponding debt levels. So there's been some discussion that this is a different plan. Um, I've been around this table. It's not a different plan. It's just some of the numbers are different. Aviation screening is coming, and um, those that travel will understand that. And it's for baggage as well. Um, again, there was comments that um, freight, Air New Zealand cargo scans, scans stuff that goes in. So, and it's also around the gateway, the customer experience. We haven't touched on that much. But imagine if we just had a little shack there, and people came into Palmerston North, and there was a little a tent or a little shack, and, and, and welcome to Palmy. I don't think that's what anybody actually wants. Um, but the risk is, if we don't do something, um, we are forcing perhaps some negative behaviour and some perhaps some negative decision making. This actually does align with, again, comments that this doesn't, this doesn't align, that absolutely aligns with it. And we'll probably hear from CEDA around Te Ū Tanganui and um, what is needed there. Um, remember, what, what the company does is us. We're part of the same family. The debt, the financing, the dividends, it's one hand to the other hand. We're the same people. We're the same, we're the same bigger entity. So we're 100% owners of the airport company and what they do is us, really, in a sense. So we've all got to be mindful of that. Sometimes we think of them as this other... Um, organisation and entity. And we must respect the board. We've put the board in and you've got to let people do their jobs. So a couple of other comments around shareholding, um, vesting of the road. Look, my, my view is pretty open on all of that, but I think they are discussions that we perhaps have a little bit further down the track. They can still be had. They can come later. Um, I think they're both. I've got an open um, view on both of those. Um, we know we're going to get some uh, more detail around the vesting of the road. The shareholding, I think, does need a perhaps a separate conversation, um, but it doesn't need to be had today. Again, like some of the other councillors, I'm really happy with the social licence, the dividend, um, or the marketing, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. I, but I think it's been clearly articulated what it does. And you ask Just Silch, you ask um, uh, Rangi Tane. You, you, you look at the, the value that the Fly Palmy Arena gets when they have a netball test or the, or the Jets play or somebody, somebody has a big um, event there. Does that add value? Absolutely it does. So, look, again, I understand the caution and, again, I came in here with some slightly different views, but I've, those, those, um, those questions have been answered very, very well. I'll come back to my um, original comment was an opening comment, it's about managing risk. So if we don't do this, I think this is, we're adding a lot more risk. I'll leave it at that. Please vote for it. Thank you. Okay, we'll look to vote now. Oh, Madam Chair, could you separate one and two, please? Or are we just voting on two? So we'll vote for one first. Just a moment.
That's passed with 15 votes for and one against. Right, moving to number two. Last year to vote. Let's pass with 12 votes for and four against. Right, we'll now move to the two other um, recommendations. The first one has been put up by Councillor Johnson. Um, do you want me to read that out? Are you happy to read that out? <laughs> I can read it out if you like. Uh, the Palmerston North Airport Limited be advised that the Statement of Intent 2324 to 2526 um, includes a 10-year financial outlook to provide shareholder confidence in the ability of the airport to manage its debt. Um, I mean, just briefly, uh, the first look we had at any 10-year outlook was in the presentation today, was not in the original Statement of Intent. Um, I would like to see, and not just a, a bar graph either, actual detailed financial planning for the next 10 years come back in the in the final statement. And so uh, this uh, recommendation intends to uh, give that direction to the airport. Any comments? Oh, we have got one. The Mayor. Sorry. Look, I think this is smart, but I just... Um, and I, I will support it. I think it, make, it, it, it it's straightforward. But I would just say we employ an arm's length board, uh, a, a governance board, who actually do have a lot of um, skill set um, experience in this, way greater than the combined experience of us sitting around the table. So I'm okay to receive this, but um, we do have to back our board as well um, in, in making these decisions. <coughs> if they couldn't manage the debt, I think they would be telling us pretty straight up. Thank you. But I will support it. Um, right of reply back to you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I totally acknowledge the Mayor's comments, but we ultimately are the ones that carry the responsibility for these decisions. Uh, we are the shareholder. The, count the Council uh, has set up the Airport Board as a commercial um, CCO. And therefore, the responsibility for being confident that the finances add up, that risk has been well managed, that the city is properly served, lies with us. Uh, and so um, I don't think we should be abdicating that responsibility um, and just uh, agreeing to stuff without actually knowing the detail of, of what's planned. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. We'll look to vote. Shouldn't be number two, though, should it? Right, that's passed one hundred percent. Thank you. Right, we'll now move to the th third recommendation, which is put up by Councillor Wood. Are you happy to read that out, Councillor Wood? Certainly. That the Palmerston North Airport Limited be advised that E, the Statement of Intent 2023-24 to 2025-26 include an expectation of a dividend of 10% of net profit after tax to be paid in 24-25 year 2 and 20% in 25-26 year 3. I want to start today by acknowledging some colleagues that are disappointed that this isn't a return to full dividend. I know I've had a lot of discussions with many of us around the table. Some have said to me, put forward that we go back to 40% next year. Some have said 20% next year and 40% the year after. At the crux of it, this is about the principle of whether an investment should return a dividend or not. And I'm certainly open throughout the conversation if the majority of my colleagues express a will for this to be 20% next year and 40% the year after, then I and I believe Councillor Naylor are open 
to amending it to that, but I think it's sensible that we, at the very least, taking into account everything that's been said today, reflect that it is a difficult time coming up for the airport and that given the board has been banking on not paying a dividend in the next period, that we don't come in guns blazing back at 40% in year two. I want to start by deconstructing the argument that's been put forward about why the airport shouldn't pay a dividend. And I had a very productive meeting, Councillor Isabella and I had a very productive meeting with the airport where we discussed many of the challenges they were facing and discussed um, concepts such as the social dividend, such as the rates and development contribution that the airport makes. And at the time I, I hadn't formed a full opinion on it. But the more I think about it, the more I think if this organisation was owned fully by the Crown or owned fully by other commercial entities, then paying your rates, paying your development contributions is par for the course. It's got nothing to do with a dividend returning to your investor and they would be expected to pay dividends above and beyond that regardless. And so though I do recognise we do benefit from the rates that the airport pays, that's as much saying that any other corporation in this city pays a dividend to us by paying rates. That is not the case. As for the social dividend, I don't see this impacting on that. This is their net profit after tax which already takes out the money that they invest in marketing and in social uh, in paying a social dividend. So this has, in my opinion, no impact on that. Regarding servicing the debt on the terminal, now that is where a lot of my concern lay. And looking at the presentation they've put forward to us, if we were to return to a 40% dividend at the time where the airport had the most debt, they would still be looking at paying down significant portions of it by year 10. So there is still a viable pathway where the airport is paying 40% dividend and paying down its debt in a timely and responsible manner. So I don't see paying a dividend as impacting on their ability to service their debt, particularly because servicing your debt comes before your net profit after tax. So the, count, the airport will have already been able to cover its costs in terms of its finances before paying a portion or a percentage of its net profit after tax. There was the argument about comparable companies and what other airports are doing, and that doesn't stack up. Nelson Airport spent $32 million building a new terminal before COVID and paid a dividend every single year. They paid a dividend in 2020. They returned to paying their dividend. Uh, they might have had a break in 21, I apologise. I'm not entirely sure on that. But they paid it in 2020. They paid it in 22. Queenstown's bought their dividend back this year. Christchurch returned their dividend this year. Napier's returned their dividend this year. Hamilton has returned their dividend this year. So if we look at our comparable airports, the conversation we're having is one of very few that other councils are having with the airports in all of New Zealand, despite the fact that many other airports, Rotorua, Nelson and others, are in similar positions to our airport. The question of this can't be measured by dollars alone, I agree. What we get out of the airport is not just purely a dividend return figure, and if we solely cared about getting the most money we could out of the airport and nothing else, then absolutely, let's put it to 40% next year. But I agree, we get more than just a return in dividend out of this airport. We get the freight that it brings. We get the gateway to our region. We get the social support that we, the social dividend that we have from the airport. So, in no world am I suggesting that the dividend is the only way we measure the value we get from the airport. But it is a way that we measure the value we get from the airport. And so, to turn to the argument for having a dividend, to start quite simply, the airport is a company. The ratepayer purchased the airport, and is paying the cost for not having a dividend. Ratepayers will be picking up the bill for the airport's profit if we do not have a return to a dividend. That's just quite simply the case. This is not suggesting that this is a percentage of the net profit after tax, so it scales. If we were sitting here today suggesting a nominal figure of we expect the airport to pay $800,000 no matter what, that would be ill-advised, that would be risky that would not be a sensible approach to take because, of course, um, there are factors that may come into play. There could be decrease in passenger numbers, there could be another pandemic, there could be a whole range of things. But we assess this yearly. But to suggest that a percentage of profit is putting at risk the airport's ability to service its debt is just factually not the case. Um, and, of course, if you don't have to pay a return to your shareholder, you would have more money. Absolutely you would. And you would have more money that you could put into paying back debt, you could put into a whole range of other things. But we as a council have taken a very serious look at our budgets over the last few months. We are doing everything we can to cut back, to make sure that the rates burden we levy upon our community is as low as possible. 
and I don't think our ratepayers should be paying for the airport to have a larger profit. We are talking about 10% here in the next year and 20% in the year after that, with a view of returning to 40% as the airport is already budgeting. So this is largely on principle. Largely on principle. It's also reflecting the fact that we voted 12 to 4 in favour last year of expecting a return of the dividend over the next two years, which has been disregarded. I want to talk momentarily about this idea of divesting from the airport or selling additional shares. What, share, what, what investor is going to purchase a company that's not providing a return? Not a single one. You purchase investments largely to get a return out of it. And yes, there's a number of other reasons that we look at, that we respect, but this whole conversation of, well, we could look at potentially bringing in other partners or potentially having other shareholders, well, until the airport is providing a return to its investors, that will not be feasible. Any other commercial investor would expect a return from their operator and a return from their investment. And I fully recognise why that was not done through COVID, and I respect that. Had I been sitting in those, this chair at that time, I would have made that same decision. But if we look at our regional players and other airports of comparable scale, they have returned to paying a dividend this year. If we look at what is commercially prudent, they have returned to paying a dividend this year. If we look at the airport's ability to service its debt while making a dividend payment, they are able to do it. So I am of the view that our ratepayers should not be subsidising the airport's profit. I am of the view that a sensible and scaled return to a dividend should begin next year, not the year after. This is not radical, this is not, I, I don't, I'm not anti-airport, I voted in favour of the last two motions. I fully support our airport, and arguments are, well, <laughs> Councillor Wood may want to kill the airport, absolutely not. This is simply about looking after the ratepayer or the investment that our ratepayers have made in this airport. And as we are looking at leveraging a 6.4% increase on them, I think the message that, oh well, the airport can keep doing what it's doing without any expectation to return a dividend is not the right one. Councillor Rupp, five minutes. That's wrapped up. Okay, so thank you. I encourage you all to support me and I'm interested in other councillors' opinions on whether it should be 2040 or 1020 as I've proposed. Thank you. Right, we've got a long list now. You've created a list. <sighs> Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to help with my decision, I uh, just want to get staff uh, as input on this because my understanding is that the um, dividend, as indicated by the airport, was going to progressively be reinstated in year three of the 24-26 financial year in the SOI. So can I please get some staff input on this and how this impacts? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the impact really is one for the airport board to assess as well. But, but from my point of view, um, in terms of returning to a dividend, the, the question really is, is an appropriate time when the airport company is, is raising a significant amount of debt, would that amount that would go towards a dividend be better used to manage the risk of increasing debt at the current time? and particularly until the point where they've got some certainty of where that, where that debt tops out post that development. So that would be my, that's my uh, advice would be, uh, the prudent element of me would say that you would wait until you've actually gone through that, that capital expenditure pr program, the big heavy lifting of it, and then you, would, uh, then you would see where that debt actually ends up. As we know when we go through these sort of construction projects, uh, there are variables that happen along the way, even with best laid intentions. So uh, that, that's the risk of, of instating a dividend too early, in my opinion. Just, just process, could you direct your question to me and then I'll go through to... Thank you. Understood, Madam Chair. Um, Bez, in light of the answer just given to us by the Chief Financial Officer, I'll be voting against this. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Councillor Denison. Oh, along the same lines, to be honest, the uh, officer's advice went, and, and even when we had this dis discussion before, I was interested in the 12 4 vote. I was just looking back f through the minutes to try and find um, uh, that position, but I understood that we went into the loan agreement um, with not expecting a dividend in the next couple of years, and I feel like this is changing the deck chairs. 
Uh, that, that's the first point. I don't think we should be changing the deck chairs on the airport board. Second one is around what the um, CFO was covering around raising debt when the, going into the um, uh, development stage. Uh, that's, I'm not in agreement on that. And so, therefore, I think this is like tinkering with actually relative minor amounts when clearly they've got the headwinds as described in the presentation to kind of navigate um, on our strategic asset. And the benefits are much wider than getting the dividend is making sure that we are the strategic leader in the distribution hub um, and that we do have that wider benefit that the, um, our residents and region um, can access flights, uh, um, all, all those numerous benefits, and this here, I think, is moving deck chairs. It's a minor tinker, and I think the city can sustain itself over the next couple of years, actually. I think the airport board's got the biggest job ahead of itself when, in comparison, so I won't support this. Thank you. Um, the Mayor. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> like the other speakers, 30 years of business, not principles of business, tells me this is dumb. This is really dumb. I'm sorry that we've just heard that they're going to borrow the money to pay us a dividend. Really? Remember, remember comments in the last debate? We're one family. Um, this is one organisation in this hand going to give the money to the organisation in this hand. We're all connected. But by the way, we've got to borrow the money to give you that and, and actually we're worse off. There is a dividend being paid. It's being reinvested into the, into the, um, the property. So to say there's no dividend, and I think we've just got fixated. I think the officer really summed it up in saying, look, there's some heavy lifting to go. You're getting it in year three. Um, I do think there's, I mean, this just really muddies the waters. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm sorry, some people are fixated on it. And my understanding is if this passes, they will have to borrow money to pay us. So they're paying it in year three. I think let them do the heavy lifting. There's a lot of... I'd say not pain, but a lot of heavy lifting to come in these uh, first two years of the um, SOI. Um, yeah, and, and examples of the other companies, um, airport companies, look, I know a couple of them, um, and they did borrow money from their councils to conduct their um, rebuilds, and some of them got some quasi-government um, COVID relief scheme money as well. So um, I think we've got to compare apples with apples. And at the end of the day, we also employ an arm's length, skill-based board who have given us this um, advice. If we, want to, if we want to vote for this, we'll be borrowing money. So I'm not going to vote for it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hancock. Thanks, Madam Chair. And the, uh, the, a number of points have already been made. Um, to be honest, this is really just an argument of principle um, as opposed to actually having... Uh, anything really substantial to say. Uh, the airport has realistically set um, 2027 as the, uh, the beginning of uh, repayment of the uh, dividend, and I believe that uh, they've shown due diligence in terms of actually coming to that position. Um, we've, we sit on an $80 million asset, so why, as a council, would we put another impediment in the way uh, for our airport company to develop itself uh, to position ourselves for the future at beggar's belief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to put my two cents worth in, I won't be voting for this either. I think that the airport board and officer gave us a really good answer, so I won't be supporting this. Um, two more um, uh, um, responses. Um, Councillor Barrett and then Councillor Naylor. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. It has been interesting to hear the comments. Um, I am fully prepared to um, support this recommendation. I thought that um, Councillor Wood laid out quite a, a sensible um, rationale around um, expectations, and I think the kind of um, questions around dividends and, and who gets them and whether that's a dividend that goes... Um, towards, you know, a social dividend or whether that's a dividend that goes towards land value that might be realized at some point in the future or it might go up or down at some point in the future or whether it's a dividend that's paid appropriately year on year as a business trades, year on year as a business realizes a profit and is reinvested across 
the entire community is the question in front of us, and I would much rather have that sort of dividend, one that is um, paid back to council, and that benefit is shared um, across the entire community. I would take some exception with the idea that, you know, the only way um, there is, is to raise debt. Um, companies have other ways of um, making money. That's how they stay solvent. If your only way to raise money as a company was to raise debt, you wouldn't be solvent for long. So I think there are options there for the company to um, look at what they're doing with um, the revenue side to pick that up if they um, choose um, to avoid um, the debt path for um, supporting that dividend reinstatement. So thank you, Councillor Wood, for laying out a, a very clear and articulate argument up front and more than happy to support that. Madam Chair. Thanks, Councillor Barrett. Councillor Naylor, last one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm also very happy to support uh, this recommendation, and it aligns very much with the resolution that was supported by um, 12 councillors late last year. Um, and perhaps, perhaps that resolution to say that we would like the dividend progressively returned within the next two years wasn't quite specific enough. I think this um, recommendation does make it a little bit more specific and explicit that that is um, perhaps our expectations. Um, our, the airport asset, you know, valued at around $80 million, is owned by all of our community. And I'm completely aware that the main return to our community or the value of that asset is in a strategic way to have a regional airport in our city. However, the second um, objective, I think, for an asset that size should be a financial one. And whilst the dividend has been suspended, our ratepayers are having to pay more rates. There's no question of that. Um, and so the benefit of having a regional airport definitely is significant, but it does not benefit all of our ratepayers, but all of our ratepayers are having to pay for that currently. I also think it misrepresents the situation to say that the airport would need to borrow for this to happen. Net profit after tax is net profit after tax, and we're just asking for a small percentage of that. Perhaps what that might mean is that less money is paid off the debt, but it doesn't. I think it misrepresents the situation to suggest that net profit after tax has to be borrowed. So I'm I'm very happy to support this, um, and I think Councillor Woods outlined many of the reasons very well. Thank you, um, Councillor Wood. Right of reply. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's been an, it's been an interesting conversation. I, I want to start by saying this is not dumb. This is what we indicated to the airport that we were going to do, and this is now what we are requesting that they do. So if it was, and maybe of, of some members' opinions that it was dumb at the time and it's dumb now, but I, I completely disagree. This is about principle, and I recognise, as Councillor Hancock outlined, it's not a huge amount of money in year one. But the intention is if we keep kicking the can down the road of the return of the dividend, and keep assessing it year on year and keep saying, oh, well, there's significant costs. There's going to be significant costs for the next six to eight to ten years, as the airport has shown. And if we agree to the argument now that significant costs means that the airport can't return a dividend, then we are binding ourselves to agree to that argument going forward. So I believe if we are to reinstate it, as almost every single other airport in the country has done, then we should progressively begin that from next year. The argument that debt equals an inability to pay a dividend is simply not true. The airport have shown us today, they've said that they can. They've shown us that pathway that even at a 40% dividend payment, when their debt is at its highest, they are still able to pay it down whilst returning a dividend to the community. So I am, I am frankly befuddled by the argument that when their debt is at its lowest, they can't afford to pay a dividend, but when the debt's at its highest, they can the idea that they I believe Councillor Naylor argued it quite well, but the idea that they're having to borrow money to pay us is not true. This is out of net profit after tax. This is money that the airport has that they may not be able to utilise to pay back debt. So the true thing to say would be they might not be able to pay back as much debt if they are paying us a dividend. And yes, that is what the airport have told us. That is what they've shown us. They've given us a map of that. They've shown us what the 18 million, I believe the figure was, over the next 10 years looks like. And yes, they could pay that 18 million straight off debt. But we in this council know very well that debt financing is a viable way 
of funding assets that have intergenerational value. And so the suggestion that they should simply pay off their debt as quickly as possible and have it all gone in 10 years and not pay a return to the community, I, I simply don't agree with. And I don't think, given the principles of this council's outline and how we make decisions about capital new, I don't feel it would be appropriate for us to apply a different set of conditions to them that we apply to ourselves and how we make these kind of capital investment decisions. The airport is an investment, and yes, we are the same family, just as any investor who has 100% shareholding in their company is the same family. A absolutely, but we purchased that family to provide services to our region and to provide a financial dividend to our community. So this is well in line with the reasons we purchased it. It's lined with what every other regional airport in New Zealand's doing. It's in line with what the airport themselves have said they can service. And frankly, I think if we don't do this now, because there are headwinds, we are setting the precedent that if there are ever investments needed by a CCO of ours, that we should simply drop any expectation they provide a return to us. And so if you believe that the airport should be providing a return, then this is a sensible way, a palatable way, to reintroduce it. If you think the airport shouldn't be making a return over the next 10 years because they're going to have high debt, then vote against this. But if we are to have the dividend back, we should scale it in, and it should begin now, as it is in every other airport in the country. Thank you. Right, we'll look to vote. Right, that is passed nine votes to seven. Pretty close. Right, what we're going to do, Cedar, we're going to have you now for lunch. <laughs> but thank you, airport. Enjoyed you all morning. It was marvellous. <laughs> Go and have a nice lunch on us. Um, so we're going to do that right now, if that's okay with you. And then after, straight after we've had Cedar, we're going to break for lunch. I think it's fair for them because they've waited all morning, as long as you guys all think that's fair. But why don't we just have five minutes so everyone go to the toilet. <laughs> five minute quick break, and then we'll get straight back into it.
times are on. Okay, we welcome David, Bobby, Jerry, and Jackie, and we start off with David. Thank you. Uh, Morena Koto. Uh, just before I hand over to Bobby, Jerry, and the team, I'll just make a couple of brief comments in relation to the committee uh, paper, item eight. Uh, the first is to note that this is a joint report with the six-month uh, six-month report and also the draft statement of intent combined. Um, Second point is just at paragraph 1.3, um, Araha Mai, there's a small error which refers to the Te Manua um, Statement of Intent. Um, I'm sure the Chair is happy to leave that to Councillor Bowen for uh, next week. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the six-month report, um, just at paragraph 3.3, .3, from a you know, contractor's, contract manager perspective, what we've seen from CEDA after the sort of reset 18 months to two years ago, um, has been a real renewed focus on connecting with partners and inward investment opportunities. Uh, some of those inward investment opportunities, or particularly in relation to Te Utanganui, the Central New Zealand Distribution Hub, I think some of those inv inward investment opportunities are, are hard to uh, put down in writing or describe within a six-month report or a statement of intent. A number of those are commercially sensitive, um, so there are conversations occurring with partners um, to, to diversify the, the, the level of investment that we have in Te Utanganui. So at the moment we have uh, you know, Kiwi Rail with significant land holdings, the airport company and two major landowners, uh, but there has been a number of um, opportunities and real engagements with um, the opportunity to bring alternative investment into Palmerston North to support Te Utanganui. And as I said, some of those things are, um, are highly commercially sensitive and a little bit harder to record, but there has been... Um, you know, significant engagement in that space and, and the Mayor and myself and others have been um, part of that with CEDA. Uh, I, I guess just in terms of turning our mind to the statement of intent, uh, just to clarify the statement of expectations uh, that inform the state draft statement of intent, just to clarify, was approved by the, joint, the, the former Joint Strategic Planning Committee um, late last year. Um, so obviously going forward, um, the statement of the statement of its expectations with that commit, committee no longer existing will be approved uh, by both councils. We do need to be cognizant of any feedback that we provide in terms of what that means for our partners, um, MDC. Clearly there's an ability to provide feedback, but if there was a significant shift in focus in any areas, that would be something we'd need to um, talk to our partners about. Uh, the comments within this report in terms of the response to the statement of expectations have been shared with MDC, um, and, and MDC's comments are included in the, uh, the table. So um, on that note, I'm happy to hand over to um, Bobby, and unless there are any questions of me, happy to hand over to Bobby and Jerry to walk you through the six-month report and draft statement of intent. Thanks, David. Over to you, Bobby. Thank you, David, and um, thank you, Madam Chair, and to all the councillors. We, um, we appreciate the opportunity today uh, to, for you to consider our 2022-23 half-yearly report and our 23-24 statement of intent. Look, our 22-23 half-yearly report is provided in the context of New Zealand and the region moving into a more challenging economic landscape and with a significant increase in the cost of living. <coughs> and many markers of economic performance over the second half of um, 2022 trending down. Despite this, the provisional GDP for the Manawatu for the year ending December 22 was up 2.7%. CEDA has continued to deliver on our key pillars of people, place and business, and our activities are anchored around our key projects such as Te Tutanganui, the Central Distribution Hub, progressing the Manawatu food strategy, destination management and development, and business support. Our 23-24 draft statement of intent reflects the continued focus on these core work streams, informed by a clear intervention logic to guide where we spend and, and, and a change in how we reflect our performance with a more qualitative feel to our performance measures. The city is well positioned to cope with the short-term economic outlook, and it is short-term, it's, it's, you know, it's a long game here and in the short-term, but we are positioned well to, to cope with that. The region's unique mix of industries continuing to support economic activity into 2023-24. And that's not to say that we don't recognise there will be some who will feel the pain 
and as always we'll be prepared to support those businesses where we can and that may be in various forms of the different programs that we already have or it might be by connecting them with somebody else who can help them where they appropriately need that help. So on that note, I'll now pass over to Jerry and the team to provide the 22-23 highlights to date and to outline key aspects of our statement of intent. And with that, well, I will just step down and let Janet step up as she will probably be able to answer more of your questions on the, the um, more in-depth knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I'll briefly comment on our half yearly report and then I want to focus more detailedly on the planning for the 2023-24 financial year. So our half yearly report, um, just to highlight some key achievements over the last six months. So the big one uh, at the top is completion of our destination management plan refresh in December last year. Uh, we've had 34 media features profiling the region and, and the city, including the Manawatu version 2.0 campaign, which was very successful. Um, 12 events supported through the Regional Events Fund, and just to note that that events fund comes to a conclusion in June this year. Um, successful, we've been successful in being recontracted to deliver the Regional Business Partnership Programme, which at the time of the last statement of intent was not confirmed. Um, overall, we've delivered to 265 small to medium businesses. Um, sorry, I've just lost my place. I'll go to the old hard paper. Um, We've delivered to 265 small to medium enterprises supported through the Regional Business Partnership Program, the Business Mentors New Zealand Mentor Matching Program, the Visitor Sector Support and the Talent and Skills Industry Activity and our General Business Support. We've allocated just under $84,000 of capability funding. The forecasted year-end position is currently around $149,000 with savings from the New Zealand Agri-Food Week's delivery, uh, staff vacancies like many other uh, businesses in the region, um, getting people into hot seats is difficult, and over the year uh, we've had additional government funding to support some of our operational costs. We are continuing to ensure the delivery against our key programmes of work as we go through the year, and the outcomes are detailed in the current Statement of Intent. Now to the 2023-24 draft statement of intent. As always, we've been given clear guidance from our shareholders through the statement of expectation, and we're pleased to present how these are going to be met in the draft statement of intent. Uh, we are always focused on ensuring we deliver on the expectations for both of our two council shareholders. Um, our vision is to work in those areas that create the best outcome for the region and the city, and the big impact projects and the key imperatives which we've heard much about this morning in the earlier presentation. We'll continue to focus on what it is that we do well, and we'll work in partnership on delivery and minimising duplication of agency effort. Uh, those key pillar projects that support inward investment to the region include Te Tanganui, the Central New Zealand Distribution Hub, and the Manawatu Food Strategy. We will continue to support the regional businesses through a number of activities, including business attraction, retention, and expansion, um, building the talent and skills pipeline, developing and supporting the visitor sector, and funded support programmes such as the Regional Business Partnership Programme. Uh, finally, our domestic visitation through the Destination Management Plan and Development is a key outcome for CEDA as the regional tourism organisation. Uh, working with partners to enact and implement our Destination Management Plan is a key sector development focus for us. We're also acutely aware of the key outcomes for the Palmerston North City Council that CEDA will be continuing to focus on. Uh, as we've talked about Te Tanganui, uh, supporting Pinati, uh, stimulation of inward investment for the city and the region, and continuing to stimulate visitor activity in Palmerston North City in conjunction with PNCC um, and MDC. And there's a specific joint priority for both MDC and PNCC, which is the development of the Manawatu food strategy. A statement of intent provides for CEDA to operate based on a deficit budget for the coming three years with moderate to small deficits forecast to enable continuation of service delivery. We are also committed to reducing operating costs, especially in relation to CEDA's current office lease, which is due to expire on the 30th of June 24. Uh, CEDA want to work closely with PNCC to bring the city's ambitions to fruition, and this has certainly been something I've been working hard on as CEO at CEDA, and I will continue to do so with the CEDA team working through 2023-24. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jerry. Um, did I hear you right? I have got a little bit of a hearing problem because I've got a sore ear, but did you say your office space is coming up, um, you're finishing your lease at 23-24? We are considering that, yes. Okay. Yep. Have you thought about where you're going to go to? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we are going to start looking in earnest, I guess, uh, later on this year. Well, there's a few hurdles to go through in that process. Um, 
then to look to see whether we can move somewhere within, I guess, what we would refer to in, a, in a, the sort of four avenues in the square around Christ, uh, around Palmerston North. Sorry, <laughs> earthquake refugee, Christ forgive me. Um, but then we've been looking at other options as well, a little bit further outside of that square, um, so that we can sort of look at what we can get in terms of value for money. And, um, yeah, so we, we, we haven't really started that conversation deeply yet, so we're just moving into that in the next few months. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Great, that was my first question. Um, anybody else got any other questions? Because there's no one in the queue. I think everyone wants lunch. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions? Here we go, they're all coming in now. Um, we'll go to the Mayor. And then thank, Councillor thank, you, thank you, Madam Council. Chair. I'll be very quick. Thanks um, for the update. Um, the, you, you touched on the, um, the, the market, you know, the destination marketing plan, which I think is really important. Um, so uh, we're, we're close, it's, it's, it's there. Just as a point of clarification, it's destination management plan. Sorry, management yep. plan. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So um, that was completed, finalised in December, and now it's well into um, implementation. So some of the priority areas we've already got underway is um, with Tiapiti. We're working um, on the agritourism space with an accelerator program that starts in a few weeks, um, a food cluster, and a few other um, trade initiatives as well. So it's it's into implementation, um, and then we're looking at the identification of a project group as well with wider partners. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I just wondered if you could. Um, give us a comment on how you see the intersection between industrial development at the airport and Te Tanganui and, you know, success factors there, mm. given the previous discussion that you were... No, we listened to that four-hour discussion intently. Um, it was really good, actually. Um, <laughs> look, from my perspective, it's what's under the seats that's important. Um, for people sitting on top of the seats, it's what's under the seat that makes the, the ticket price you know, palatable. So we've had some good discussions with um, Air New Zealand. We have regular meetings with them. Um, we're involved with um, the discussions that are going on around the um, returning of jet services to um, the airport. From our perspective, that's certainly in relation to the activities of Te Tanganui. Um, it would be a gem in that, um, that project. So it's very, very important to that project. Um, and in terms of the industrial development around the airport, how does, it, how does that fit in with your view of the strategy? Oh, look, um, um, I guess in terms of responding to that, we think of it in terms of not just the airport precinct, but also the northern industrial zone as well. Um, look, there are a lot of cogs that need to be turned to get to a value proposition that allows people to invest with confidence. So that could be Pinity, um, the advancement of the airport plans, um, settlement of what's going on with the key rail hubs. So there's a whole lot of cogs in there that need to be um, turned. Um, my view on that is, is that in the next three to six months, a couple of those at least will be resolved or advanced. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions from me, and then I've got one from Councillor Dennison. Um, Jerry, staffing, has your staffing settled down? And I see you've got a new staff member that you might want to introduce to us. Uh, yes, I can do that. Um, behind me is Tainui Woodmass. We're delighted to announce him as our new um, Māori Relationship Manager. He's been with us about 16 days. Um, he's doing a fantastic job and I think it's going to be a, a great asset for the team. Look, um, I think uh, in my entire time in this role, we haven't been at full horsepower and we are currently out for three um, end vacancies, which are going to get us to a point where I think we'll be one FTE ahead of where we've been in the past. And that commitment to those new roles, two of them at least, is to realign what we do to support sectors of strength which our shareholders have indicated they want to be supported. So very excited about the near future. Welcome aboard. And my second question to you, Jackie, um, financially, what would be the challenge that you see coming up for the next um, year for CEDA? Um, I suppose that obviously rising CPI costs um, on the organisation, especially um, with the, the rent of the current premise we're in, and we think that's a sort of a relatively, not easy, but you know, a, a, a good way to sort of look at just reducing costs in those places. Um, I suppose just ongoing like it is for um, most of our business community at the moment is that um, you know wanting to um, keep the staff on board, <laughs> retaining staff is really important um, and so therefore obviously the, the rate of CPI increase in the, the um, unemployment um, rates around at the moment and all that sort of stuff uh, like us, like any business is impacting on our, on our ability to be able to do that so that's something we want to be able to concentrate on going forward. 
Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Councillor Dennison. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I also had I picked up on your people uh, around the workforce and um, those key sectors there, freight and logistic health and school transition workforce plans, etc., have been established. But have you got a comment around some of the wider needs around um, the workforce for our our city, around the, the feedback that your employers give you that the need around that? Yeah, look, it's a good question. Um, the sentiment I get and that Greg Bignall, who's our, our business manager, get from the people we engage with is that getting people into job positions is still the biggest barrier for people to grow their businesses. So it's very, very um, you know, important for us to keep that moving, that conversation moving, which is why we're reorienting the way we support businesses in those strategic um, you know, sectors rather than doing it by pillar, so that um, we, we see it would be better for businesses to get a person who takes them through the support of their growth, their staffing and their investment as opposed to having those in single pillars. So we think that's going to help to you know, keep people here. Secondarily is a great work that's led by Janet's team around the Manawatu NZ website in combination with the city and the district. To We often talk to our stakeholders around they can have the technical expertise to attract people to do jobs. Our role is to attract them to the beautiful region that we live in. Yeah, and so do you have, in relationship to the workforce, do you have um, advocacy into immigration? Like, is that seen as a, a means to bring people in to meet that workforce shortfall? Can I get some comment on other means of strategy to help address businesses? I'm not specifically having conversations with immigration per se, um, but we are pulling every level we can, and in particular around trying to attract people to the region to have our value proposition up there. Um, you know, and it's related to, I guess, exposing potential uh, people who want to move to the region about, it's not just about, you know, what the job is, it's about what you can do when you get here. You know, the fact that it's five minutes, ten minutes to travel anywhere, that you can get a great schooling, that you can get, you know, work for your spouse or, or partner. So, so it's all about that, more of the value proposition of selling the region. Yep. And, and Janet, um, a second... Sorry, go for it. Oh, just further to add that, um, to that in terms of the workforce development, so through some of our strategic projects such as Te Tanganui, we've actually worked, partnered with UCO and some of the um, major employers in that sector to identify the types of roles where there are gaps and then work with, um, I guess, the tertiary as well as secondary um, sector to look at that pipeline because we know where we're aiming for in terms of some of these big investment projects which are, are long term. We need to make sure that we're, we're preparing as well, not just addressing the current um, shortage. So we do have a lot of work in that talent development pipeline space with some of our regional partners. Great. Just a second um, question, um, specifically on an article that was released last week with a hike in the OCR, where one um, economist was suggesting that the high inflation is to push um, unemployment up to 74,000 people, and it may be time for a new solution. Is there any feedback that you've got even at this early stage around the confidence of employment um, and business owners around that that impact of the OCR moving up and the indication that they will have large unemployment? Um, look, from the engagements we do, we're not hearing that yet, but I think there's a cautious, um, I guess, um, scene that the, the, the business owners and the people who manage businesses are, 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 are telling us that this might be hitting us soon. So the, you know, the OCR increase, um, I think one of the things that was interesting last week was when the announcement was made and banks said that they weren't going to increase their rates because they already baked it in from the last time, didn't land very well. So I'm sure that businesses are going to you know, um, have that on their radar in terms of what it looks like if it steeples up much higher. Just in terms of, uh, Jackie's just confirmed to me that we do have a partnership agreement with Immigration New Zealand, which is managed through our business development manager. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Right, uh, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Just a couple questions. Thanks, you for um, yeah being with us for the morning and now the afternoon. Um, you mentioned around a sustainability toolkit for employers is one of the one of the things there. Just interested, um, what kind of uptake and what you're doing to monitor impact with that? 
Yeah, so that was um, rolled out as part of our wider employer toolkit, which is again focused on that retention of staff, not just the attraction into, but how they retain and upskill, again, to um, future-proof businesses and support their growth when there's not many people to um, bring into roles. So we rolled that out through some workshops across the city and district, um, and now we're sort of monitoring, downloading click-throughs. It's part of our toolkit where our business growth advisors meet with businesses every day, um, and it's often one of the things that is covered. Um, we are doing a refresh of it to help increase the uptakes. I think sustainability is still quite a scary and nebulous thing for a lot of our businesses. So one of the areas we've been focusing on is um, building case studies, so showcasing what businesses are doing in that space to show um, you know, how, how it can look and what good does look like, and that's gone really well. I think that's being used as sort of, I guess, a a conversation opener to get businesses to think about it because when um, all of their costs are rising, the talent pressures are on, it's one of the last things they want to think about often, um, or mm. the hardest thing. So, yeah, it's, it's ongoing. Yeah. If I can add, um, Councillor, we are currently in discussions with both the district and the city around a programme called Sustainable is Attainable. I think last time in front of the chamber we were challenged to, or asked whether we had um, much to do with other EDAs. This is a programme that's been run out by Venture Timaru, so we've been working with them to see if we can bring that programme to the region. Great, thank you. Um, final question was just around kind of what's happening in the... In the um, innovation and startup space, there's a little bit of comment there around um, activities from the factory, the Innovate um, competition and, and the um, Sprout um, investment cohort. Could you just give us a bit more information around kind of what's being achieved through there? Yeah, no, that's a really good question too. We um, actually had Sprout and at the lead team a few meetings ago just to explain their process and how they're going forward with their, I guess, spinning out of innovative, um, you know, companies and things in, in their programs. It's fair to say that one of the challenges we put to them was that a lot of those opportunities aren't currently in Palms North and we want to be able to get um, CEDA in front of each of the cohorts to say, look, uh, here's the value proposition for setting your company up in the region. So that's been really good. We've had some great discussions with the factory as well. Uh, we've realigned um, our statement of intent um, draft outcomes with what they're doing for us to make sure that it's got a good alignment with what we're doing. So we're really comfortable with how both of those relationships are going. Great, thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, team, all of you. Nice to see you today. And um, two and a half hours, Jerry, not four. Felt like four, but it was only two and a half. Um, questions about the statement of intent. In the, the, the very first, the lovely, I don't know, dartboard diagram at the beginning, um, and around the outside, it talks about effective partnerships with council, central government, Māori, and business support groups are the key to successfully developing outcomes. Um, it was that business support groups, I wanted to understand more who we mean by that, please. Which page are we You go from the round circle. Oh, you go. Yeah. Um, so generally it's just um, like Jerry said earlier around making sure we're not duplicating effort, um, knowing what's happening in the region, what other um, agencies, especially EDAs, but, but other um, um, business support agencies are doing as well. Um, so one, so that we can keep um, the engagement with our business growth advisors um, so that they can be aware of what other support is out there for business, um, but two, so that we can just yeah, make sure we're aligning programs of work or um, and not doing that. I mean, there's groups like um, Te Pakahi, which is the Māori business support group in the region, and so the, the other you know, business support groups that we work with to try and yeah, make our offering better and wider and more inclusive for people. There was a great example of this, I think, <clears throat> two weeks ago where we had a, an event that was offered through uh, the city, the chamber and us at CEDA and there was another part there around doing business in Vietnam, which I think is a great example of how we leverage off other business agencies. Thank you. You'd want to say something, Jack. Oh, no, I, I, yeah, I was just going to say we do have sort of, I guess, weekly and monthly um, working relationships with Manawatu Chamber as well as fielding promotion. So we do have, yeah, really on close contact to make sure we're aligned and looking for opportunities of collaboration, not duplication. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and my second question was just about um, profiling the Manawatu locally, nationally, and globally. And um, I know you tell us about this when we get the email that you send out, Jerry. Thank you so much for that. But uh, featuring the region through media, I just wanted to seek a comment from you on how you feel um, our outreach through the media is going. Um, we've actually had one of the strongest profiles that CEDA's had in history over the last um, 
12 months or 18 months, and I think um, there's been a real shift in terms of some of our major investments in the region getting us on the radar, um, but as well as a lot more positive PR, people looking at us as a place to live um, and sharing those stories of our people, as well as the work in the domestic visitation space has really, I guess, lifted the lid and um, opened up a lot more media partnerships for us that we haven't been able to get before. Um, so particularly with New Zealand Herald stuff and stuff travel and stuff business, um, we've got some really strong partnerships there um, and ongoing work. The numbers are really, um, I guess, inflated because we managed to get quite a lot of international PR with the Coastal Arts Trail being so unique and um, a world first with the, the Valerie. Um, so that has really bumped it up, which um, will make next year look a little bit more challenging. But um, I, th I still think that we've built some really strong momentum um, with where we're positioning the region and, and the engagement that that's getting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Uh, final question from Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your report. Very interesting indeed. I was wondering, with agricultural tourism, have CEDA had any correspondence at all with um, the Schnell Farm in Bunnythorpe, who have a robotic milking system? And um, quite fascinating indeed. And they have busloads of tourists turning up to see their operation. Um, so from an animal point of view... Question? Have you had any correspondence with the Schnells in Bunnythorpe? Uh, yes, the robotic milking farm we have um, been in touch with for years um, when they first set up and we also um, pushed them forward for some of the, I guess, conference work as well as the recent BOMA bid which we got. They were put forward as one of the um, itinerary options there. So um, what we're actually looking to do is encourage newer operators because there is um, not enough of them. Mm. Um, but it, And it's also connecting, I guess, in a cluster people like the Schnells with the Stuart Dairy Lands and the like to, to get more um, collective offerings as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the questions. We're going to move into comment now. Really, really happy for you to move back. So um, going here, I'd like to move all three recommendations, seconded by Councillor Wood. Um, just first off, I'd like to um, just say well done to CEDA for the um, six-month report that you put forward and your statement of expectations. So thank you very much and well done going forward. Um, you do a great job for our region. I know it's been a bit tricky when we separated um, from having been part of the um, Joint Strategic Committee, so that's been an extra bit of work for you to have to work with the two councils separately, but you've done that very well, so well done to you for doing that. And um, um, I just want to say going forward, thank you very much. And I'll now move into others that want to comment. The Mayor. You can hear some banging in the background there. Um, look, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, look, thanks to uh, Bobby, um, Jerry, and, and the wider team. Um, economic development is a long game, as we know. I think that's been said a couple of times. Um, and it's one of relationships, really. And many of them are high trust in, in, in many cases. So um, just want to acknowledge MDC. I think you went to MDC just recently, and I understand that was a good discussion with that council. And again, um, I think Councillor Bowen was teasing out what, what the other relationships, some of them were, but obviously with the business community and um, iwi and, and, and the wider community as well. Um, the, the three things that come to me are around people, business and place. And if we focus on the people aspect first, um, that training and placement of, of people is really, really important. I'm not going to go down a negative path, but there has been a couple of um, uh, company closures in recent times, and it's really important that we redeploy people. Um, and I'm just contacting some people now to make sure that our friends at the former Easy Buy workforce are fully redeployed in other places. So that's really important, and we can't, we can't forget that, because um, I do think that's going to be a little bit more uh, rocky road before we get into... Um, some better space. As, the, as Bobby, the chair, said, um, there is a bit of a short-term blip at the moment. Business, it's around not only attracting people but retaining our own people, uh, our own businesses, and understanding if there is a bit of um, short-term pain, how can, how can we help or how can the agency help? 
And then finally about place, and I have to commend you, this is the first time I think since the exception of Cedar that we've got a proper destination management plan that everybody's fed into and that the Stafford Group really understand. And these guys are exceptional operators across Australasia and they're showing real interest and I think they're coming to speak to us at some stage, again, on the implementation. So, well done. Um, again, it's a long game and uh, it's taking bite-sized chunks at it. And well, yeah, you've done a good job. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and yeah, thanks um, Bob and Jerry for, and team for being here for the almost day now. Um, sustainability um, area, really do um, appreciate um, that you're making some initiatives there and appreciate that that's um, an area that may take a while to get um, traction. You talked about um, encouraging people um, to, to get and encouraging businesses to get focused on that. It might be worth sharing with them that um, Council's low carbon investments um, on a life cycle basis, we're currently getting a, a dollar forty back for every dollar we put in. So there is quite often a, a financial incentive there for businesses to actually get into that space. I think we've got at least one good local example there and would be encouraging um, CETA to really help businesses steer into, into those spaces um, in, the, in the years ahead. I'm really pleased to hear around um, getting CETA more um, strongly connected and, and more strongly focusing um, Sprout and the, and the factory around regional um, opportunities and ensuring that we see some of that um, um, good work that they're doing um, land strongly back, back with us. And, and finally, really pleased um, with the um, quality of the, um, of the statement of intent in terms of it being quite detailed and, and quantified in terms of those deliverables. I actually think there might be some learnings there for us as we think about our long-term plan process that we're sailing into. But overall, I'm really impressed with um, the report and, and the outlook and look forward to um, seeing you guys next time you're here. Hopefully we don't make you wait so long, Madam Chair. <laughs> uh, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thank you to the team for, for coming in and presenting those reports, which um, I agree with Councillor Barrett's comments were um, yeah, told a really interesting, compelling story about the work that you're doing and the work that you intend to do. But I wanted to comment today to say a particular thank you for the work that you do in an ongoing way to try and keep elected members abreast of what um, what the work is of CEDA. Yeah, there have been comments in the past about elected members maybe not having a good grasp of economic development, um, or particularly the work of our economic development agency, and I really feel there's been a, a concerted effort um, on your part to make sure that the information is there if we choose to find it. And we don't have to look very far because you seem to ping into my email box <laughs> usually once a week, if not more. So thank you for the effort that you put into keeping us abreast of the work that you do, which is you know, often behind the scenes, um, supporting our, not just our business community, but primarily our business community in that space. Um, long may it continue. Thanks for the effort. Thank you, Madam Chair. And finally, Councillor, oh, sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor Marshall Lobb. Thank you, Madam Chair. O te rā tēnā tātou, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. I'd just like to um, reiterate and support the positive comments made by my fellow councillors, um, but I wanted in particular to say um, congratulations on producing a report that also promotes Māori. So throughout this, you've got, you've highlighted kupu Māori, te reo Māori, and given that prominence and honoured that. And also I note about your relationships, um, how you're working regionally and, um, you know, across the region, and also locally with iwi and hapu, and I congratulate you for that, and thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. That's all the comments. Let's, we'll now look to vote. <laughs> that's passed unanimously. So that's fantastic. So we'll now look to have lunch and we'll come back at, um, goodness me, um, 1.35. We're all good on that? Okay, we'll, we'll see you at 1.35. <laughs>